Hello again, everybody. It's the April 15th tax time edition of the Jim Cornette Experience, and there's nothing more taxing than watching SmackDown or Dynamite. Plus, we're going to talk about wrestling collectibles with Tony Giese from Heritage Auctions, a mini edition of Guess the Program, and so much more. But right now, joining me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. He's the man who pays more taxes than the entire population of Liechtenstein and the Isle of Malta combined. The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again for another fun week of wrestling talk. That's all you got? That's all I got. I don't know what you That's want me to say about got. my taxes. Oh, boy, here we go. It is a grumpy weekend for you, isn't it, when you have to actually turn loose of something? I literally just said another fun week of wrestling talk, and you said, look at how grumpy you are, whatever you said. That's not well, fair. Well, yeah, because you didn't jump in with the spirit of things, contribute to the discussifying. How many things like that? How many accountants? Because I have several who do different. Does it things take for me. to screw in a cornet? How many accountants have the Beatles' "Tax Man" as their hold music? I would say forty percent. <laughs> you know what? Based on the ones I'm dealing with, you're exactly right. Actually, congratulations. <laughs> oh, it's better than Jake with "Comfortably Numb." <laughs> That's still the best one. <laughs> When he no showed you, right? That's when he yes, had it on. Yes, yes. You call it, and, and uh, oh, who was it? Was it Dog or no? Who was it that when yeah. they called him, they they had played the Frank Sinatra version of dun 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 dun, dun start spreading the news. <laughs> they were going to work for Vince. That's oh, how the man. office found out. I don't know. <laughs> they they oh, who the fuck was it? It may have been JYD. I don't know. But yeah, at one time, the fucking booker calls the guy and, and he hears on the answer machine, start spreading the news. <laughs> That's amazing. I never heard about someone playing uh, New, York, New York on their answering machine for that. Oh, boy. So I and I'm going to answer some accusations against my judgment this week that came up on Twitter. Do you know that people accused me of being taken advantage of by my fine plumbing and heating and air people and also electri electric electrical people uh, yeah that's right electrical people the electrifying electricians that i employ from tom drexler here and you know call the plumber whose name is a number it was a mass invasion of castle cordat it looked like the huns were storming the 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 parapets or whatever but this was the big week. I've been planning this for six months, and this week it was set aside because this, I, I, you know, I keep a weather log, Brian. Actually, a, not necessarily a weather log, but I keep careful watch of when I turn my heat on every year, my air every year, uh, the, my propane usage, my various the, the various climate control systems, right? I keep a careful log of that so I know at which points they're going to be at peak usage. Don't you? No. No. Uh, I thought everybody did. But anyway, so I determined... No. ...that this was... <laughs> I believe you've registered that. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I've, I've picked this week because it's usually the, 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 the time of the year, give or take a week or so where you don't need the air and you don't need the heat. And that's why I picked this week because as I believe I've mentioned, I've been upgrading. Not only we did the remodel that we've been planning for quite some time, but also over the last few years, my furnaces and my air conditioning units and my water heaters, all the, the major the heart and soul of the house that pumps all of the various shit that needs to be pumped and spewed out and things. They were getting nigh on to 20 years old apiece. It's time to change. And I don't want to be a senior citizen here in the next two to three months of uh, fucking changing all this stuff. I'm doing it right now. And this was the last furnace and air conditioning unit that we needed to change out. Now everything is within the last couple of years old. And as well, my vault, people have seen pictures of the vault. It's got its own climate control system with the dehumidification and the temperature control. But I had a new system, one of the space age ones. They didn't have shit like this 20 years ago. Put in there as well to make sure that the 
memorabilia is safe for future generations. And this got a little more complicated because you know I've become an addict of the spray foam insulation. This shit is, it's just the bee's knees. It's, it's swell. And it's like, we, you know, we put it in the new remodel and there's not a draft and you don't have any energy loss. And with good windows and doors, well, your heat or air barely runs at all. Whether it can be the, the, the harsh climate outside matters not because it's like you're living in a styrofoam cooler. The hot stays hot, the cold stays cold. That old, you know, uh, uh, tagline there. So I love the spray foam insulation. Are you, are you taking this ride with me, Brian? Yes, you've been bragging about I said bragging again. You've been yeah, uh -huh. loving on loving the spray on. foam insulation. So I decided, well, I should do that to the attic spaces because both of my attic spaces are still in, in part of the original house. And they're very old, very old. Nigh on to 70 years old. The, these attic spaces need to be insulated with the modern space age materials that we have at our disposal these days. And then I was, we were looking with my contractor. So, you know, in my big attic space over at the far end of the house, I'd like to have some more flooring because it's just the joists and things. And that way I could store more stuff up there. Not talking about collectibles and uh, like paperwork. You know, believe it or not, Brian, I've got a lot of paperwork. And I need more places to store it. So I said, we put a floor in there. So while he's looking at that, he's, we look up in the light that's in this space. One bare light bulb. It screwed into a socket that was hanging at an angle and screwed into the ceiling beam by one screw with a, you know, pull string or whatever. It didn't look like it was up to code. So I had the electrician come in, put new attic lights in the attic spaces so we could see how to do this work. And then, as I mentioned before on the previous program, there was insulation that needed to be removed before the new insulation could be put in. We had to bag that stuff up and throw it out the window of the vault into the backyard rather than carry it through the house. But anyway, so this was the big week. They came on Monday, and they took the furnace and related stuff that's going to be replaced out of the one attic space and carried it downstairs and got rid of it. And dismantling all that took quite a while on Monday as well. Corky the lumberjack came, and I'll have you know, thankfully, was able to extricate with a system of ropes and pulleys and a support that he built that big tree out of the giant tree from our last bout with tornadoes and surgically extricated so he didn't do any more damage to any of the tree that it landed on. And that took all day. And then Tuesday, they came in and they finished up that attic flooring. And I counted every single one of the motherfuckers that went into the attic came back out. So I'm, I'm keeping count, right? I've got a notebook right by the log? front door. Do you have a log have, of who I comes in and goes yes. out? All right. And if they, if they come in, I log them in. And if they go out, then I, I pull the old log out. Anyway, so then Wednesday, we're ready for the big to spray foam. They're going to spray foam Wednesday, and we got a backup day on Thursday in case they can't get finished. But they're like, oh, okay. Well, they come in, and, and here's the layout. They've got to back the truck with the pumping apparatus all the way around the back of the house and run a 250-foot hose through the second floor window into the vault and through to the various attic spaces. And they decide to start with the one where the furnace is being replaced in that space first. And it ain't that big. And they, but then they've got to go down this triangular, what they call a knee wall. It was like a three-foot slanted triangular area that they had to go about 40 feet down behind, through the underneath the roof and behind my various bookshelves. And this, uh, And they're wearing hazmat suits. Right, and it it doesn't smell good, but I'm not in the immediate area, but you can smell it going. But they're they're wearing hazmat suits, and it now it's unseasonably warm this week, so they're insulating the attic. That means it is not really insulated right now, so it's hotter than fucking three shades of hell in there. And this guy's in that hazmat suit, and this shit stinks. And he gets in this 
triangular three foot wide crawl space area under the roof and goes about 30 feet and it gets stuck and starts freaking out <laughs> and the shit's fogging his face up and everything and he's squatted down and he finally got the end and backed up out of there and they came to me and said we've got to go home he, he it looked like somebody poured a bucket over his head when he pulled his fucking hood off he said, my legs are numb. I can't feel my legs. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> he'd been crouched down in there and stuck and duck walking trying to get out. So I said, okay, you guys can go home and come back tomorrow. <laughs> so on Thursday, they, <laughs> they come back. And they do the same thing. They've left this, this giant truck rig, and they just drove off and left it. They come back, and they rev their shit up and they got the hose through the window again and they go to the big space and they're in there a good part of the day because it's still hot again that day. But finally, we're all ready. We're all insulated. We're all ready for the big day where all this shit's going to get put back together. And that's Friday morning and they're here at 8 o'clock in the morning and I tweeted this out a couple hours into this. I said, oh, the, the census at Castle Cornet is... Four trucks, one car, five heating and air technicians, two electricians, and something else, uh, you know, blah, 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 just, you know, making light of the situation. And this where I said aspersions were cast upon my ability to hire proper people because people on Twitter said, well, I shouldn't need that many. It's probably four to watch and one to work. And <laughs> I bet they're taking you. Okay, Brian, you should have seen these motherfuckers out there sweating their balls off. Because here's what the people replacing the furnace inside the attic space to carry this bulky shit and their tools and their equipment and all their stuff, they have to go from my driveway. And they've got a dolly, but there's steps. They got to go from my driveway. 50 feet down the front sidewalk to the front door, up a couple of steps onto the porch in the front door, up two flights of stairs, 40 feet <laughs> down through the vault in the Anne Frank door, which they've got a duck because it's only three feet fucking high. And they've got to fucking hand this shit from one side to the other and then do all this work in this. At least it's well lit and insulated you know, attic space to put this complicated horseshit together. Meanwhile, the folks on the other end who are replacing my the vault climate control system, they're doing a different thing, and they actually have to fucking pack on their back. This He was a chunky fellow, very nice people at Tom Drexler, but he was, he was the chunky one. He was the hoss of the, of the bunch had to put this 60-pound fucking wall unit that's going to be attached to the side wall of a dormer on the second floor where nobody can see it because of the, it's on the back and the eaves of the house. They're tucking that away. He's got to take that up a fucking ladder, leaned up to the second floor on his back, and hand it to this other guy that's hung from this fucking thing from the peak of the house uh, so he doesn't fall off the fucking roof into the chasm below. And they're mounting that shit. And they, when they got here, they realized that the guy that wrote the order up didn't account for an electrician. So they had to call over to the office, and of course, immediately when my name was mentioned, Blake, the electrician that saves the day every day, was sent over here immediately, and he had to go get some shit that they didn't account for and come back and install that and go to the crawl space where the sub-panel is. But besides that, I don't care if they sent 40 people because I was paying a flat rate anyway. But I'll have you know that by the time the day was over, all this stuff was installed and working, and I've never been so fucking cold in my life. You can hang meat up here right now. It's amazing. So when you had these people on one side and these other people on the other side, where were you? I was rotating and vibrating between the inside and the outside, answering, where's your breaker panel? Where's the sub panel? Where's this? Where's, where would you like that? Are we putting this in the right place? And I watch how they do this shit. It's fascinating. They're, they're, they're incredibly technical, things like that. When's the last time you had your attics insulated, Brian, last? 
Uh, I believe they were insulated when I bought this house. Oh, have you checked? Yeah, we just had someone here for the attic uh, a few months ago. All right. May, uh, is it Attic Owl and his attic service? Did you say Attic Owl or Attic, attic Owl? Owl? No, Attic Owl. Old Owl, he does attics. It was not Attic Owl, no. <laughs> I've seen his truck. Old Owl? That's, it. That's who you call if you got bats in your belfry. Anyway, so I want to recognize a few people. <laughs> I've got, uh, no, no, because seriously, I went, I don't know what it, it was Christmas in April for some reason. I went to the post office box the other day to pick up the mail, and several people had sent me shit unsolicited, uh, just out of the kindness and compassion of their heart, the generosity of them, and I wanted to recognize some people for doing that because it was very nice. I got what was supposed to be a box of three dozen Three Musketeers bars and a couple of bottles of Sprite Zero from Theo in Canada. You said but supposed a, to be. What do you mean? Because apparently, according to the note, that's what it would have been. But apparently, across the border, you cannot send Sprite Zero. Maybe they mistook it for nuclear fission material because I got my box of Three Musketeers, but there was no Sprite Zero in the box. It had, and it had been tampered with when it came through customs. So they confiscated my Sprite Zero. But thank you, Theo, nonetheless, for giving me sugar diabetes, as Aunt Lola used to say, with three dozen Three Musketeers bars. And also, a, a, a fella you know, I think you know this guy, Charlie from Starkville. You know that fella? I've heard of him, yes. He was kind enough not only to send Stacy a Depeche Mode t-shirt, because uh, she has tickets... For at some point this year, in some location, I can't remember all these details, but she's going to go see Depeche Mode. Uh, but I'm also, guessing that'll be a concert you won't be attending. That you, you know, you don't have to be a prognostication expert for that. I like the music, but you like Depeche Mode's music, really? I, I, yes, I'm fine with the music, but I don't love to see the crowds. What's your favorite Depeche Mode song? Why that one they do. Whenever they do it. All right. And Sounds then, like you're talking about just can't get enough, but go ahead. That's it. They, there you go. Yeah, I can't get enough of that. <laughs> um, but also, <laughs> Charlie sent me, I'll have you know, a DVD of apparently, I had not seen this one. There's like 50 or 60 tracks on it. Every routine that Jerry Clower may have ever done is on this one DVD. It's two disc set, actually. Or not a DVD, but a CD is what I'm trying to say. A Jerry Clower CD with just two two CDs even. You're not going to actually put that into your CD player, are you? Why would I? You don't know what this guy's sending you. It's a here, it's, no, it's sealed. It's, it's sealed in its own factory juices. You're going to be sealed when you put this thing in and it's a bomb. Oh, for heaven's sake, it's not a bomb. They sold a bunch of them. And also, and Nathan from Marble Hill, Missouri. And boy, I tell you what, that's a big, shiny metropolis these days. Guess what he sent me in the way of CDs? He heard our discussion that we had quite some time back about the, the dear, the sweet, the beautiful, the gorgeous Cousin Ruby, Ruby Star and sent me five Ruby Star CDs. And boy, howdy. Uh, she's on the cover of every one of them, as you would expect. And I want to thank Nathan for that. And finally, and this was amazing. Because I, I think I mentioned our, our, my friends Brandon and Aiden from it, it, the, their store over there in Howell, Michigan, used to be Galaxy VR Arcade, but now they have rebranded because they have expanded, and they're Galaxy Records, and they have records, and they have all kinds of cool other stuff as well as the games and the the porn. joyousness and everything. There, there might, it might or might not be any porn involved. I don't, <laughs> probably not with Aiden, but I don't know about that Brandon. <laughs> what, what? Did you say there are kids... Going to this place? Well, no, well, no it's 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 I don't, it's fun for all. But it, they're over, <laughs> they're on East Grand River Avenue in Howell, Michigan. If the authorities want to investigate, but anyway, listen for the Howell. 
<clears throat> yes, they'll howl in the middle of the night. They sent me a box of of records, actual vinyl records, of uh, a few other things, but the impressive things were the records, including a '60s Alfred Hitchcock presents Ghost Stories for Kids, you know, uh, cover, and the disco single. That's a 12 inch, 33 and a third record for you younger kids that didn't live through the disco era but it's um of chase uh because i've got it obviously i had it 30 something years ago but i've my cover is so beaten up because i would record our cassettes for entrances and I, back then i carried all of my or all of our entrance music in multiple cassettes in my bag because generally, you know, on the regular towns, Crockett always had somebody carrying the music after a while when more people got music. But in the early days, and everybody didn't have music, you would have to give the tape to the sound guy at the arena every night, and then I'd have to remember to fucking get it afterwards. And if we got chased out of town by a fucking rabid mob, I wouldn't get it, so I'd lose multiple tapes that way. And so I constantly was making more cassettes off of my disco single. So the cover's beat up and it's all scratched up. And this one's a nice one. Um, Did the tape ever get eaten up at a show? Oh, God. We had anything from people who were operating the sound system who were, you know, the, it was the janitor and he didn't know how to work the shit to the old cassette playing systems in the buildings eating a tape to a lot of times they started having uh the ring announcer carry a boom box and this was even in the wcw days folks in the early wcw days i remember tony gillum carrying a you know a, a cassette tape case around at a fucking boom box so if we were in a subpar building you'd be at ringside and hold the microphone up to the fucking tape player that's how i used to play music when i was a ring announcer hold a microphone to the PA system up to the tape player at spot shows and shit. This was, it was not state-of-the-art stuff back then like it is today. And um, and the, the Midnight Express, the Chase Disco single, I don't remember how long the album cut was, but the disco single was 13 minutes long. So you could make fucking you know, uh, multiples of those and take as long as you need to get to the ring or whatever the fuck and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, we used to lose all kinds of tapes and and it was actually sometimes worse when the building people were in charge of doing it. Oh, yeah, give it to Joe over there. And uh, it was, sometimes you'd have to actually have some stooge that you could do without during the show sit next to the sound guy to tell him here, play this tape when this guy comes out. Here, switch it real quick. Do this, blah, blah, blah. Because they wouldn't, they didn't know music at wrestling was new at that point. They hadn't been doing it. Were there any places that either didn't have a tape player or in the back, not like at ringside, there was actually a record player? I don't remember seeing a record player. To be honest, because actually that probably would not would not have even in the 80s they would have been long removed from that but in the Evansville Coliseum they had a pipe organ and they had one in the Louisville Gardens too oh, awesome. I think they still do uh there was a big organ in the Louisville Gardens and it had a history behind it but this pipe organ in the Evansville Coliseum you could walk right up to it and see it off the side of the stage and it had been because the Evansville Coliseum I'm pretty sure was built in the early 1900s and it had probably been there since the 20s or 30s and the old veterans that ran the because the evansville coliseum the it's like the war memorial coliseum the vfw or the veterans administrative organization there that's who rented it out and benefited from it and they were always sitting there to watch their shit right and they but next to this organ because we had been doing the thing where I would take my goddamn portable boombox tape player up and hold the microphone up to the speaker to play Lawler's entrance music or Handsome Jimmy's or whatever. And next to this pipe organ, they had this big uh, sound control board. It was 
this is 1979, 80, and it was probably 10 years old then, but it was primitive enough I could figure it out because it's like putting a stereo together. I said, if I just get an RCA phono plug adapter to plug in there, I can play my tape player through their sound system. So I, and they're like, boy, don't touch anything. I was like, guys, I think I got this, right? I think I can do this. And I plugged it through and showed them. I said, now watch when I turn this volume and I press this and it's going over the PA system. They're like, well, God damn. But shit like that. But it, back to Brandon and Aiden, who by now have <clears throat> had a chance to get rid of all the porn that might've been in the basement <laughs> before the authorities arrived. They also sent a Billy Paul album. Oh, nice. Uh, that has me and Mrs. Jones. And guess what else? Uh, here, well, there's other things, but the big thing, the soundtrack album to Deliverance. With dueling oh, banjos and oh, everything. Oh, yippee. Oh, that sounds wonderful. I no. would love wait, to listen to that with the whole family. It's a very rare, it, that's a rare piece. But also, it ha I forgot that it has all the songs from the movie or that were even played in the background of the movie. And it has also one of Mama Cornette's favorite songs on the <laughs> soundtrack album of Deliverance. I'll have you know. Did Ned Beatty sing it? No, I can't remember. Actually, I think they played it in the background, but it brought it to mind. But there is immediately, so Brandon Aiden, I thank you. The point is, I open up and there's Deliverance and I flip it over and there's one of Mama Cornette's favorite songs, Mountain Dew. Well, they call it that good old Mountain Dew and them that refuse it are few. I'll shut up my mug if you'll fill up my jug full of that good old Mountain Dew. She used to sing that to me when I would sit on her knee or, well, Actually, I was a fat little kid, and she was bony, so I'd sit next to her knee, and she would sing. She would sing to me now. My brother Bill's got a still on the hill where he brews him a gallon or two. Buzzards in the sky gets drunk. They can't fly from that good old mountain dew. Now do some Billy Paul. My Uncle Mort, he sawed <laughs> off his shore, he measures by four foot two, but he thinks he's a giant when you give him a pint of that good old Mountain Dew. Now that's not Philadelphia International. Well, you know, hey, Isaac Hayes could have adapted it. If it had hit the Superfly or the Shaft's Big Score soundtrack, it could have been a whole new audience. But anyway, Brandon and Aiden, thank you for... I don't know why it was Christmas in... In April, all of a sudden, but people just, they normally they want to take, take, take. They write me and ask me for things, even free things sometimes, the gall of them. But in this case, it was give, 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 not take, 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 take your booty, take your, all it's right. It's not take your booty, it's shake your booty. What are you even singing? Well, you got to take your booty somewhere to shake it. Right, where are you going to take this show? And then bring it back. This is um, your show. All right, Dennis. Take your boot. Um, no, one of the cult of court, Dennis from St. Louis. Now, be respectful here. He's sick. He's got a torn artery, a major artery in his neck, a stress-induced tear because he's been stressed out and and obviously frazzled and it at wit's end taking care of his mom because she's got Parkinson's. And he's been trying to get through the program well not get through the programs but get through that by listening to the programs he says he's been in a painkiller induced fog but dennis does say the show is better when i'm not in an opiate induced stupor but that may just be my opinion so i'd like anybody obviously send good wishes to dennis and his mom and hope they feel better and let us know if the show's any good if you're in an opioid induced stupor well, that's where I was going with that. Can we get any commentary for it or again it just so we know where we stand with these type of things? We may be opening our programs up to a new audience one way or the other. I recorded the shows for about a week in an opioid-induced coma about a month ago. Do you do you think most of our audience would it likes the program better if they're on drugs or off drugs? I think that's one of the beautiful things about this show is that it unites the drug addicts and... The Namby Pambies. I don't know what to call it. No, 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 come on now. No, no, I can't. I can't. What in the world? 
it, it unites everyone. Everyone can listen to this no matter what state of euphoria well, you, you well, are now, in. See, you went right from drug addict to Namby <laughs> Pan. There's no middle ground there. There's no... no there's, Nothing I, but I middle ground. You dabble a little bit, but not have a problem. You've either got to be full on Keith Richards or elsewise fucking Jack fucking Webb. What? You could dabble away, or you could be Keith Richards or Jack Webb. I guess that's both sides of the spectrum right there. Dragnet or drag Keith Richards out the door. Yeah. It's as far as you can go from east to west, I would figure. But, um,. <laughs> I'm trying to... Now, Steve, I wasn't through it. We got to go to Reggie's Corner here. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the, and the pollen. The pollen is so bad. But they say the rain, if it comes, will wash away the pollen. But since the weather we've had, I'd rather have sneezing, wheezing, and dripping instead of fucking death from tornadoes. So we're living with this. But all right, uh, Paul... From somewhere, I can't determine where, uh, but Paul lost his cat Speedy last Christmas, and now his dog Leica is sick and is not going to be doing well. And he sent a picture of both of them together in, in happier times, as they used to say. And and it, I hate, I'm not even going to talk about the fact the illness and what was diagnosed and everything because I don't want to go into that i'll start crying but he says i'm glad to be a part of reggie's corner though because he's he's looking at it from a positive standpoint so we salute both speedy and Leica from reggie's corner on behalf of all of us paul you have finally embraced the idea of reggie's corner well that's they've they're now they're writing in asking to be a part of it to recognize their friends that they have lost so i guess we're gonna do this if you'd like to be a part of Red, well, you don't want to be a part of Reggie's corner. <laughs> that... uh, Stop it. If you have a sick animal and you just Stop gotta it. talk to people, write the <laughs> Reggie's <laughs> corner. Would the you... sicker, the funnier. <laughs> Would you stop it? We've got to talk about paralysis. Do you have a cat with feline AIDS? Please write into the show today. Is there such a thing? As feline AIDS. Let me look this up. The wonders of the internet. Feline AIDS. Oh, yeah. It is an actual thing. Feline immunodeficiency virus. Well, <sighs> it's cat AIDS. Feline AIDS is a viral infection commonly known as FIV and is spread by cats fighting. Just like human HIV or AIDS, cats infected with FIV can develop a reduced agility, or excuse me, a reduced ability to fight off infections as the election be laughing. Why are you the, laughing about a reduced ability? Because I got ability. agility and ability mixed up, and now I'm a mess. God damn, you got to duck that infection. <laughs> you dazzle it with your footwork and get away from it. The, disease, I, the disease progressively disables the immune system. See, at first they didn't think you could get AIDS from pussy at all, and now we find out it's cats to begin with. Is that the end of Reggie's Corner? Is that well, yes, because we've got to talk about paralysis. <laughs> so I'm told him, I'm not kidding either. I thought you were kidding when you said that before. No. <laughs> the next email concerns people being paralyzed. <clears throat> in, actual, in actual fact, not in fucking pie in the sky theory. Um, It's from Earl. And Earl's written in. I recognize his name. Oh, for heaven's sake. And and this is not good, but it he's making a point here that I thought while I'd brought everybody to seriousness with Reggie's Corner, we'd make this and then continue with frivolity, not realizing that we were just going to pull our puds all the way through this thing. So Earl wrote, Dear Jim, I just listened to your comments on the April 3rd podcast about what's going to happen when one of these AEW wrestlers or any any of the wrestlers breaks their neck and I had to weigh in. My dad, Earl Jr., left the hospital for shoulder replacement surgery and after being home for five minutes fell three feet off of his deck due to still being woozy from the pain meds, but he severed his spinal cord. Oh my God. He was immediately sent back to the hospital for nine months where he had to learn how to breathe again. 
He was never able to eat again, never able to use the bathroom again, never able to even scratch an itch. I was with him 24-7 for the last four years of his life and ended up losing him years earlier than I should have. I could speak for hours about how difficult his life was, all from a three-foot fall. Wrestling helped us pass the time, but we both cringed every time we saw a wrestler land badly or do something foolish. I can tell you firsthand, our entertainment is definitely not worth someone becoming paralyzed for life because we know firsthand this is not an experience anyone should have, and I wish I had the opportunity to tell some of these wrestlers to tone it down a notch. And I wanted to read that because it bears listening to, and it's not coming again from a grumpy, bitter veteran that can't hang because I could never have done that shit to begin with. Um, or someone not wanting guys to get over. And, and truthfully, a lot of times it shouldn't even be the responsibility of the wrestler to tone it down. It should be the responsibility, as we've mentioned many times, of the agents, producers, assistant bookers, bookers, promoters, whoever is in charge of whatever company. It should be like you have to have a realistic grip on a risk-reward ratio for what you're doing for the venue, for the amount of money you're making, for the fucking overall good of the business. Even if it's a self-serving you know, interest by the promoters and the and the bookers of not wanting guys that they don't particularly think can draw them any money or ain't going to be using too much of going out and just outshining all of the people they're depending on to draw money or they're going to use on an ongoing basis and at least be business smart about it, even if you're not being you know compassionate enough to want to just keep somebody from breaking his fucking head off on general principle do you see what i mean brian i do and you know we've all had our concerns watching a lot of the recent events a lot of the recent wrestlers that have been appearing on tv doing more and more outrageous isn't the word more and more extraordinary things that the wrong step the wrong slippery spot and it could all end and sadly as you're watching some of these people do the things whether on they're on top of a ladder or running across the rope, or just flipping endlessly, that is one of the thoughts I always have, is this could go wrong real quick. Is it going to go wrong? Thank God it didn't. Well, later on in the program, well, I saw one. I, I haven't even seen anybody make a big deal out of this on Twitter. And it's a couple of days ago, so everybody's forgotten the bump now because they happen so often, but we'll talk about it later on on the AEW program where I thought, well, one more inch and he could have taken his head home and his fucking check baggage. But anyway, speaking of checking your baggage, have you checked your mail yet, Brian? Have you checked your mail yet, ladies and gentlemen? Well, don't check it quite yet because you ain't got nothing there from me, but you will soon because the Cornets Collectibles Big Spring Spectacular Sale that started last Saturday, April the 8th. Now, the Feather Bottoms, due to their incredible, not only the Feather Bottom Ultra Careful Handling System, but their speedy service system, all of the orders that flooded in over that weekend, and it's been pretty stiff since then, have been sorted out and are ready to start being filled. We're going to be signing. I'm going to be signing. They don't sign anything. Especially that that because they've only got one hand each anyway, Hotchka or uh, Fanny and Felcher. It's enough they can do to just work without having to worry about signing things. But I'll be signing uh, the first items that were ordered on Saturday, April the eighth, when the sale took place. I'm starting those tomorrow. By this end of this week, probably most of the non figure-oriented orders, like for the Inside the Ropes magazine, or the Inside the Ropes DVD from London with myself and JR, or various other items, probably be winging their way to the people, and the first set of figures will start going out by next weekend, and boy, we're going to whip right through this, but you can still be a part of the action, folks. I've got some updates 
you know that Monday Night Raw figure variant that I had, Brad? There are three of those left. Three? If you want one of those, there's three left. The Monday Night Raw variant. And of the thousand limited edition autographed breast cancer pink and black action figures with $10 each going to the American Cancer Society, almost 600 of those are gone in a, a little under a week. We got 400 to go. And over half of the Inside the Ropes magazines are gone. So if you want one of those, uh, look out over the next week or so, just to be sure. And uh, jimcornet.com is the scene of all of this chaos. Uh, order today and save the problems that you will have tomorrow. What problems will what you problems? have tomorrow? Yeah. I'll be mad at you if you don't order today. <laughs> That's a problem you'll have tomorrow. You heard it here first. There he is. Speaking of hearing things first, we did another breaking news. Of, uh, people, if you're listening to this program, expecting us to go into detail on the latest drama with the EVPs trying to gaslight CM Punk and their his fans, and uh, the latest efforts from the EVPs mouth organ, I mean house organ publication of the Wrestling Observer and Uncle Dave. We've already talked about that. We did a special edition of the drive through podcast, and we'll tell them where they can hear that, Brian, so they don't get behind. Well, by the time this show comes out, you could hear it wherever you find your favorite podcast in the podcast feed for Jim Cornette's drive through or if you are a subscriber, one of almost 350,000 subscribers to the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel, you have already seen clips for this as of today. You've already seen <laughs> clips for this. They are up right now. It just it get on YouTube and do everything because now we're just recording every day with the the bullet like speed, the lightning like speed that this uh, breaking news breaks all the time. It's it's shattering. Positively obliterated the news these days. Well, all plus, right, I, I need to take advantage of whenever you actually have free time. Whenever it's like, okay, one of the Monroes like stubbed his toe, they're going to be gone for a few hours. We can record something. It's wonderful. You know, that was another song on the Deliverance <laughs> album. One of the Monroes stubbed his toe. That old ditty. That's How does it go? Bluegrass song. How does it go? One of the Monroes stubbed his toe, and I'll tell you what, I hated to see him go. All righty then. So. <laughs> all righty then. Uh huh. <laughs> I said at the top of the program that we're going to play a little guest the program. I did a, a trade of some things for some things with a guy. And one of the items that I got, I'm just, I'm, it, it brought up a uh, kind of concept of card that uh, they used to have back in the territory days, as well as a point that can be made about today, which we'll get to in the end. But I thought I would turn the tables on you. And honestly, this is not going to be hard for you. But as I said, it's going to bring up an interesting discussion. Okay, I'm going to go with Florida. 19, oh, can I guess now or how does it's, it work? It's going to be more difficult than that. You have to actually hear the first name okay. or two or the first match or whatever. And it ain't Florida. So there you go. I'm a genius. I just ruled out one of the 50 states. Well, now I've narrowed things down. God damn it. It'll be even easier now. Only 49 more to go. But basically, for the people who might not listen to the drive through and what in the hell is the matter with you, guess the program is where Brian usually finds a program in his collection, his memorabilia, and it gives me the lineup, and I try to guess the date and the place, right? And right. by date, we mean year. And but every once in a while, we, wild card bitches, you know, we flip it around. But we're just going to do this one here. But are you ready to take note? Because now, Brian, there are eight matches. So you might have to jot oh, this down. Okay, that's telling. What's it telling you? Well, let me hear the first match. All righty. I can't actually give you the full championship that this match is for, or it would be... I did just be foolish for me to say that, but is for the state championship of the state that this card is being held. Norvell Austin versus Dick Dunn. The second match 
for the Southeastern Junior Heavyweight Championship, Lee Thatcher. <clears throat> Lee Thatcher. That's the way it's written here, but I have a feeling it's Les Thatcher. <laughs> Les Thatcher versus Kubla Khan. Third match for the Women's Mid-South Tag Team Championship, Paula Kay and Donna Cristinello versus Susan Green and Peggy Patterson. The fourth match for another regional championship that would be too specific, the Medic versus Mike Boyette. Okay. For the United States Tag Team Championship, the Infernos with their manager J.C. Dykes versus Rocket and Flash Monroe. For the Women's World Championship, the Fabulous Moolah versus Tony Rose. For the World's Junior Heavyweight Championship, Danny Hodge versus Jackie Fargo. And finally, for the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship, Jack Briscoe versus Ken Lucas. Okay, I'm writing down the card. I usually don't do this, but you said eight matches. It's a lot to digest. It's a lot to digest. Um, my first thoughts are it's either Alabama, Upper Florida, Pensacola, Florida. You, I, I won't, I won't dilly dally you around any longer. It is indeed Alabama. Can we? Do we? Do you know a town in Alabama? Um. I don't think this is Birmingham. Mobile, Alabama. No, it's not. You that. are correct. No, I am correct. Yes. Oh, look at that. Yes, that's why I was laughing. You are um, correct. Mobile, Alabama. What's the date? Okay, hold on now. So Briscoe's the champion. Hodge is the junior champion. Mula. Well, you know what? That doesn't help anyone. <laughs> uh, Lee Thatcher. Well, I, that's why I'm saying I think it's Les Thatcher. I want to believe it's Lee Thatcher against oh, Kubla Khan on. here. Uh, I'm going to go with, it's either 73 or 74. I'm going to go with 73. You are correct. November 6, 1973, Mobile, Alabama, Lee Fields presents the Night of Champions. And what they did was they went to the big building the auditorium, and this is this is the point I was going to make about all this. I knew you were going to get that because it was fairly easy. And by the way, the state title was the Alabama state title, and the other regional title was the Gulf Coast Championship. No credit. I knew you were going to get it because it's easy. Thanks well, a no, lot, I, buddy boy. No, well, I mean, no, it, it didn't test <laughs> your ability. It wasn't easy for the regular you know, fucking Tom's dick is hairy out there somewhere, but for an expert like you, this was not a stretch. I think you'll you'll agree with me on that. Right, and again, for me, just to let people understand how I got to where I got to, Briscoe being world champion caps it at a couple of years there, 73, right. 75, and then you try to figure out who would be where, where were the interns and Ken Ramey, and I ended up with 73. It, and was, I didn't it, was, think the, it was the Infernos and J.C. Dykes. Excuse me, Infernos I, and J.C. Dykes. And I didn't think this would be a Nick Goulas town, so it had to be somewhere else. Yeah, I had too many people on the card for Nick to pay. But, um, but no, the reason I brought this up is eight championship matches. And <laughs> there's two points to be made out of this. One is championship matches when championships meant something were an attraction. But now, and somebody's out there going to say, well, Cornette, geez, they had eight titles. You say all the modern companies have too many championships and then nobody can keep track and blah, blah, blah. This was a thing that, especially in the early 70s, was done as a special attraction card of its own. This was not even once a year. This was maybe once ever. They probably didn't do another one in Mobile. 
Uh, Nick Goulas used to do it to death where, you know, he would just find world six man belts when nobody has six man title. He'd find shit in his closet and just pull it out and make a night of champions. And, but Nick overdid everything. But the night of champions principle in those days, especially in, in many of the Southern promotions that could work together was if you got a date on the world heavyweight champion, then make it a big deal. Call Mula. Of course she'll come and work for you and defend her title. And and it wasn't as much to pay her as it was to pay it probably Danny Hodge to come in. And the Southern Territories, Georgia could work with Florida and the Carolinas could send somebody or McGurk or whoever was in the Gulf Coast or Memphis or whatever. So these were not championships that were on TV not only not regularly, but almost never. You never saw the NWA world champion on your local TV or the world junior heavyweight champion. Except if you were in the, you know, the McGurk territory, that's where Hodge was based, or in Florida, where Briscoe was based. Otherwise, you saw interviews and occasional film footage, but it was a rare thing. And then you would have, for example, I think the Southeastern junior heavyweight title here well, this predates when Ron Fuller bought Kazana in Knoxville and established Southeastern right. Wrestling. I think it's an old belt that they had laying around. And where was Les Thatcher? Probably if he wasn't in the Gulf Coast, he might have been in Carolinas. The Carolinas, where, you know, they. Oh, well, actually, no, 73. Remember, in 73, he was probably working out of Georgia. Okay, so from Georgia to Mobile, and 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 the people in Mobile don't know that the Southeastern Junior Heavyweight title is fictitious because they tell them, yes, this guy that's defending this championship all around the Southeast is coming in. And it adds to the thing, and they already know the Alabama State title and the Gulf Coast title. And the tag title, the U.S. tag title, that was their local title. So when you put all that together... Now people say, oh, golly, instead of seeing the tag champions and one of our two singles champions, we're going to see eight title matches. And that's wow. And so that would draw. And you would, uh, that's they, a concept that I, go ahead. Did they raise the ticket prices like they did in Memphis? Uh, it doesn't have the ticket prices on, uh, probably not in Mobile. Uh, but it doesn't have them on here. But. Eddie Graham would do that a lot, would be championship prices in effect if he had multiple titles at stake on a card. But that's the point that I'm making is that this was something that was rare and special and treated as an attraction in and of itself, the fact that there were going to be that many championships defended. Now, they try to do it these days. Four titles will be defended. And you see that on TV for free every week. It, and And with Tony, he's got... So many of these regional and other company and associated belts, you can't keep track. And with the WWE, they've got women's title on SmackDown and Raw and men's title on SmackDown and Raw, even though it's reigns as universal. You know, they've had so many belts split up that it it damaged it. There's an intercontinental, there's a U.S. title, blah, blah, blah. And you see it all the time. So that negates what made the Night of Champions a special promotional gimmick in the territory days because you never got to see that. And it was the same, the Super Bowl of wrestling they did in Cleveland Stadium in 70, what was 73 or 72? The three ring deal when yeah. they had everybody come in and they lost their ass on that one. But, but that's what I took. The two biggest attendances that we had in Smoky Mountain Wrestling who filled a Knoxville Coliseum up both times one time was with a a card based around titles being defended from every major promotion, and the other one was built around the legends. And those were special because we never did it before or since. And you would, if we'd have done it again, uh, you know, volume two the next year, it might have done well, but not as good as the first one. And but that's that it, the championships used to be used in such a way that they could be a draw until it was overly repetitive and prostituted out, and now it just it's just confusing. Yeah, if you were a promoter in a small territory like let's say Alabama, 
and you got a date on the NWA world champion, which is one of the main reasons a lot of people wanted to be in the NWA, just to get a date with the NWA champion. Would you see the value in trying to build up a show around who you already have working for you and having the NWA champion or bringing in all these outside people or you know, not all these outside people like Moolah and various people coming in with different championships to do that because you do have to pay the NWA their cut. So it's not like pure profit based on the NWA champion coming. There is money that has to be sent back to the NWA too. Well, but the thing, and the, and the answer to your question is, would I do one or the other? They did both because yes, Jack Briscoe, that was probably his first time in mobile as the new world champion. That's probably why they had the idea to do the night of champions. Yeah. November 73. That probably is his first time there. Right. But then if he came back toward the end of 74, early part of 75, they wouldn't do that again. Cause they'd done it. Then they would have a couple of hot program matches from their you know, own local territory that were ready to go underneath the main event. They'd have a challenger ready, you know, that uh, Ken Lucas was big in that territory as a baby face, but it might be somebody else next time, but they would, they would still try to get a date on the NWA champion, but they wouldn't do the night of champions thing. Cause they just did it. That would devalue it. They'd try to have another hot program or something else going on or some other theme or, in the title match itself, is it a rematch from a year and a half ago? But this time, the special referee is going to be Cowboy Bob Kelly, goddammit. Or whoever's big in that part. Of the, so they would have a different twist. So you would do both. You wouldn't just beat that to death. Or then it wouldn't mean anything. Like, 18 belts don't mean anything now. Is Ken Lucas the biggest Southern wrestling star that nobody talks about? Possibly, well, at least of that era, possibly, yeah. The, I mean, he was never a big singles draw in Memphis, and a lot of people have studied Memphis. He was in tag teams, and also his probably longest and most successful run in Tennessee was before any of the video still exists, late 60s, early 70s. But people, he, he was a great worker for, for the Southern style and for the people. He could fight, and it was believable, and he had fire to him in the ring. Uh, he, uh, Ricky Morton, he didn't train Ricky Morton per se. Ricky was already in the business, but Ricky always credited Ken Lucas, who by that time was in his easily mid forties as teaching him a lot about how to sell and how to work and timing and fire on comebacks and things like that. Even though Ricky looked totally different than Ken and different styles, but it was same concept they were applying. He was big in Alabama, big in uh, East Tennessee at one point uh, did a lot of work for Nick Goulas at that end of the Tennessee territory. So, yeah, but there's not a lot of video, unfortunately. But anyway, that's that's the thing with that is the, the Night of Champions thing and also the idea of there were different territories and different circuits so you could have established stars that you could still bring in from 250 miles down the road to augment your card for a big spectacular like that. And that's the way the territories could work together. Oh, and you mentioned the NWA cut. Here's the thing about this. Honestly, by that point, I don't believe there was a, an NWA cut in the world junior heavyweight title. If there was, it was purely to get Danny Hodge because within a couple of years, that and Hodge's accident and having to retire, it wouldn't mean that much anymore. And Moolah, you paid her for her and her girls, but there's six girls from Moolah on there. You're paying them the same thing as the guys, probably less than, you know, big name guys would have charged to come in. And a couple of other Jackie Fargo from Memphis, because he was a name all over the South that could come in and lose to Danny Hodge, but you weren't beating a local guy that you were depending on regularly at that time. So this was not that much more expensive than a regular card they might be presenting besides the world title match, which theoretically should pay for itself. The bigger expense came on gambling and going to the big building in town. And uh, Nick would do that sometimes. He'd go to the municipal auditorium in Nashville instead of the fairgrounds when he had, you know, something hot going on because you could put three or 4,000 more people in that building. And that would be sometimes the bigger expense that you would go to if a promotion wanted to 
you know, go to a big building for a bigger show. But that that usually was when the when the office in that town was only running a smaller building regularly anyway. And there was a possibly a need to upgrade. If they were in a fairly good sized building, they'd just try to, you know, maybe do championship prices and add a dollar or two to the overall ticket price. Anyway, but you passed the test, Brian. You've won guess the program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Would you like me to sing some more to you? No, come on, no. Let's play more well, guess the program. All right, well, how about how about I'll make a phone call or we'll play a phone call. Okay. Um because I mentioned at the top of the program we we're going to talk about wrestling collectibles. I said last week here on the experience that at Heritage Auctions, a, an old uh, Dallas office championship belt is coming up or is actually uh, underway now for the auction at Heritage Auctions. And so we've got today Tony Giese from Heritage Auctions on the program. I actually recorded this phone call uh, earlier because Tony's on location with another big sports event. But he took a few minutes to talk with us about not only this championship belt going up for auction at Heritage, but also just wrestling collectibles in general, and flummoxed me with some news that I was not prepared for. So if we've got that recording, maybe we can pipe that in now over the pipe organ and let the people hear uh, Tony Giese from Heritage Auctions. All right, we are on the phone with Tony Giese from Heritage Auctions. And Tony, uh, I've told the people last week on the program about the championship belt that's being auctioned at Heritage. Right now, as a matter of fact, we thought the, I thought the sale started April 20th, but it actually started today as we speak, but it goes for a few more weeks. So everybody still has a, a chance to get involved in this. But you had called me, and thank you for being on the program, by the way. I'll let you speak. It is an honor to be with you. I watched you growing up, up in northern Wisconsin, and if, if you'd have told me that I'd be interviewing with Jim Cornette, I would have laughed like, there's no way. So to me, it's such a treat for me. Well, see, and, and Tony, thing is, I hate to pop your bubble, but I didn't grow up in northern Wisconsin. So it must have been some no, other guy No, no, I did. I did. <laughs> and I watched you that, I watched you Saturday night, and I cannot believe that I am actually – interviewing with Jim Cornette. <laughs> so for me, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. Well, you know, they say Wisconsin is America's dairy land and I, I concur wholeheartedly. Every time I've ever crossed a state line into Wisconsin, I've taken a big whiff and said, smell that dairy air. But anyway, um, <laughs> so you called me a couple months ago. You'll probably never call me again after this program. And you said, Jim, I've got something here that someone has submitted that you probably would be the one to ask about this. And it turns out, as I mentioned last week on the show, it is one of the old American Tag Team Championship belts that was used in the late 70s out of the Dallas, Texas office, Fritz Von Erich. Uh, people, the modern fans know it as world-class wrestling. This was actually, this belt was used for the few years preceding when they rebranded themselves as world class in uh, the early 80s when they got the uh, syndicated television deal. And it's one of the old Nikita Malkovich belts. And I love those. I mentioned, uh, you know, the NWA world tag title belts that Crockett used, that Midnight Express held in 86, and the late 70s, WWWF championship belt that superstar Graham had. And so many of those classic seventies belts were made by Nikita Malkovich. And so we, we started tracking down the history of the thing, but from your end, without divulging any, you know, trade secrets or anybody's confidentiality, um, you know, heritage has a great reputation. People bring them various items from different fields, but how did you get contacted about this? So somebody did an inquiry with the belt and any wrestling stuff they always give to me. You were the first person I thought of because I didn't know. And when I, you know, I, when I thought NWA, I'm like, oh my goodness. Okay. Because I saw the different countries, you know, on the belt. 
but you were the first person that I thought of and you, you know, got back to me and said, you know, you gave us the information on it. And, uh, I actually went down to Houston to pick this up when I did a show there. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's in, it's in great shape. Um, there's some wear to it, of course, as there's going to be, but, uh, the lady who had it, um, easy to deal with just super nice. Um, she, her family was involved in wrestling and that's how she got it. She had no idea the value of it. And you were so gracious and, you know, giving us your estimation on it. And we're so, so helpful on, on dating it because I had no idea that it was from, you know, Fritz in the late seventies. I had no idea on that. And you were so helpful with it. So, well, I mean, one of, and it's, one it's, of the... it's a cool, cool piece. One of the uh, one of the reasons why it's in such good shape is because they didn't use it for very long. It was only in use for uh, I think about three years before they had to change the the branding. But uh, as as we went back and looked, as soon as I saw American Tag Team Title, I said, "Okay, the most noted American Tag Team Title belt or championship in the U.S. was from Dallas. The Midnight Express held it in '85." Um, sure, and. Um, so then I, I started looking back, and apparently for all the listeners, what happened was in the 60s, in the, uh, out of the Dallas office, the top tag team title was the American tag team title. And then for whatever reason, and this may have been lost to history, but a change in bookers or Fritz had a different idea or whatever, for a lot of the 70s, their main championship was the Texas tag team title. And when you look back, the Texas tag belts were also Nikita Mokovich um, belts. And it's, it's so funny because let's, I, I was talking to you uh, when we were you know, discussing this originally. All of these championship belts were not custom made from scratch. Every design, every plate, the belt makers would reuse different designs, different molds, and then you know, customize the name or whatever. But so the the American Tag Team Championship still has the side plates, has like the flags of Arabia and Italy that the World Tag Team belts yep. had. But you never got that close. The fans never got that close, right? Where they could really just study mm -hmm. it. And it looks so great well, on they television. Could see it and then you could, yep, yeah. Because my no, NWA, I mean, it, 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 well, I was just got my NWA World Tag Team title belts. I got a replica set of. If you see, he dolled them up with a lot of little bells and whistles that you could fasten to the plate to make it look intricate. The world belts have a little quarter-sized uh, replica of the state of Texas just randomly placed on the main plate on the side. It's just, <laughs> but they look really cool. And the point is that apparently in about 1978, um, that's when David and Kevin Von Erich had broken into business, Fritz's sons. And if you go back and look, and I encourage anybody can go back uh, and uh, or Google the wrestling title histories on the internet. If you're looking at the Dallas World Class Office, you go back to the 70s, tag team titles, Texas tag team title. Then the American tag team title was reinstated in 1978. And apparently the last, the final match to determine the new champions was David and Kevin Von Erich against Dorian Terry Funk. And uh, obviously Fritz was, you know, an important enough figure in Texas wrestling and wrestling in general that he was able to call in a favor like that to have two former world champions come in and put his sons over. And now they are the American tag team champions. And this is what we believe this, this belt from the set of belts that would have been used for the next three years as the American tag team title. And you know, we talked about the history of Bruiser Brody held that title at, at Poet Gino Hernandez, I believe, was involved in it. And the tag team belts, it was always the first one out of the belt bag. So whoever was champion at some point or another wore both belts. They weren't like assigned individual belts. Right. But it's, it's a cool piece of history, and you can see it's obviously ring used because there's sweat and uh, the, the sweat stains on the leather at the top and bottom. And, you know, a few bins in the edges where you'd fold it up and put it in your bag. But it's a really nice piece. And uh, how can the people now, I've said I blew the the on-sale date or the start date of the auction. 
But how can people get involved in this if they want to just even view it or read about it or potentially put a bid on it? Yeah, they can go to ha.com and um, just type in wrestling belt and it'll, it'll be the first thing that pops up and then they can view the item. They can, they can view the photographs, the write up on it. And um, you know, it, it, again, it's in really good shape for something, you know, 45 years old, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, it's a really cool belt and just the design of it. And it's got the red leather on it. It's just an, it's an, an incredible piece of wrestling history and, uh, you know, we expect it, you know, we have, a, I think we have an estimate of 10,000 on it. So the opening bid will be 2,500. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's such a cool piece. And again, I, without your help, we would have not known how to really date this thing. So you were really, really helpful in this whole process. So I well, can't thank you enough. I, uh, you know, again, it just happened to be, as soon as I saw the picture, because that happens to be, and, and Brian and I have talked about it on the program several times, we talk about championship belts. Overall, those Nikita Mok Mokovic designs were some of my favorite because they looked good on television and they looked like a prestigious championship belt and they had weight to them. When, when we carried those, or I carried... That was part of my job as manager and, and bag carrier for the Midnight Express. I carried both of the NWA World Tag Team belts on top of my carry-on bag through airports and wherever we went for the seven months we were champion. And 35 years later, I, my right shoulder is still two inches lower than my left shoulder. Because those things weighed 20, 25 pounds a piece. Well, you've held that one that you've got. Yeah. They're Imagine heavy. Two they are them. heavy. They're, yeah, yeah. They're very heavy, and they're very, you know, they're sturdy. They're well made, and uh, my goodness, that's that's a great story. Because yeah, I, I was I was surprised when I when I first held it. You know, the quality of it is so so good. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. Well, and and uh, that's one thing about the modern belts. Uh, the replicas look as nice as the belts that the uh, promotions use these days, but they're all a little lighter and a little. A little more modern looking, and they don't have that 70s vibe to them. You can see superstar Billy Graham holding one of these up, or, you know, the Midnight <laughs> Express or whoever. But, hey, what, what – I've done some stuff with Heritage, as everybody knows, over the last year with the Wrestling All-Stars trading card sets that I found in the vault. Um, and those things are, are always hot. But what are some of the other – wrestling collectibles you've seen or are looking at or seeing these days people are interested in? Yeah, I mean, we've seen a pretty sizable jump in all of wrestling um, as far as, uh, you know, autographs, type one photos, original photos, um, ring worn stuff. I, you know, it's, you know, the ring worn material is so hard to find because wrestlers, you know, it was, it, it was a lot of times they would keep them and it's just they're so limited and they display so well like on a mannequin think of some of the robes the macho man robes of course rick flair robes um you know the ring worn stuff there's a great great um you know a lot of people are trying to find it it's hard to find but we got a really cool autograph we got a uh jean ferre andre the giant signed eight by ten from edward carpentier's collection and um you know andre very tough autograph. Uh, he would sign autographs, but, you know, around 85, 86, he kind of stopped signing and was just didn't want to be bothered with it. So to find it, a real Andre autograph, it's difficult to find a Jean Ferre from the 70s is virtually impossible. And well, uh, we that have one that was I was just going to say that would have been a like a two year window where he would have signed that name anyway, right? Two or three at most. Yeah, yeah, it would have been like early seventies, and it's you know he would sign, but it's just nobody thought they'd be worth money. And now, I mean, this one here we've got it's got a five thousand estimate, but um, you know Andre is kind of the holy grail as far as wrestling fans. Um, are well, now, now hold hold on here a second. Now that you brought that up, because I don't have a, a Jean Ferre, and those things are, as Aunt Lola would say, scarcer than hen's teeth. But uh, <laughs> and by the way, you've seen it. Does Andre, for a guy with fingers the size of Polish sausages, does he not have incredible penmanship? He does. That's a very good point. He's got a gorgeous signature, 
And even like the Andre the Giants and the Andres, they had a very nice autograph. And especially and, um, the big decorative I, I got a John A. Bray, Toronto, but that uh, the the big decorative A that he would do. Yeah, uh, you absolutely. Know. Um, but that's what I was going to say. I have my uh, uh, Wrestling World centerfold of him holding the Golden Greek Mike Pappas in his arms, <laughs> and autographed to me and a very Andre the two Jimmy Andre the Giant. If, if, if what if, what if, do I need to do estate planning on this thing now? Should this be under glass? Yeah, I mean that's that's probably a ten thousand dollar autograph. The and fuck! It's hanging it's on my out. fucking wall. I just had the goddamn insulation people walking by a ten thousand dollar <laughs> fucking. It's it's a ten thousand dollar autograph. I mean, I got lucky when I got my Jean Ferre. I was up in Toronto for a show, and a guy had it, and I didn't know he was Jean Ferre in the 70s and i'm like that's andre but that's not his name i had to look it up and then i ended up buying it and it, it's in my collection but um you know andre eight by tens they've gone up considerably in the last three or four years because everybody wants them he's the one him and bruiser brody's the other one that nobody has and those are the two in my opinion i mean it, it took me shoot 15 years to get a bruiser brody autograph because he was just, you know, in character a lot of times. And it's not that he was a jerk or anything, but he just didn't sign a lot of things. So, you know, I we've seen the wrestling autographs really go up in value because, you know, some of them are very, very limited. Well, and by the way, my Andre is an 11 by 17. It was a color centerfold. So Whoa. Are you I'm, serious? I'm, yeah, that's, that's I'm going to get a velvet amazing. rope. I'm going to get a velvet rope to mark off that section of the house. But anyway, all right. Well, Tony, I, you're at you're on location at a uh, prestigious event, so we appreciate you taking a couple minutes out. But tell the people again one more time on the American Tag Team Championship belt from the Dallas office, late 70s, as we've discussed earlier. It's the Heritage Auction Spring Sports Auction that uh, the belt yeah. is a part of, but they can go to where and do what? Yeah, they can go to ha.com, and the belt will be on our website. If anybody ever has a question or anything they ever want to talk about wrestling, my, my office number is 214-409-1997. And my goodness, I you know would love to talk wrestling collectibles with, if anybody wants to ever talk about it because it's fun. I enjoy it. I still enjoy it. You have just given your office number to over a million people. That is, un I will, I love talking wrestling. I collect <laughs> wrestling, so. <laughs> we could talk well, wrestling collectibles. I'll talk to anybody, absolutely. <laughs> all right, well, I'm sure the folks will respond, Tony. And when does this thing close down? As I said, I blew the on-sale date, but when does the auction close? They got to shit yeah. or get off the pot, as Mama Cornette would say, by what time? They have 27 days to bid on this auction, so let me get the. It is. Thinking, thinking, thinking. What's that? It's, it's May 17th. It's, it's May, May 17th is, is when the auction ends. May 17th. See, you, the email you sent me said May 12th. I'm beginning to believe that there's a. The problem with our community. <laughs> what we got here is a failure to communicate. All right, well, folks, jump in on this. Get the belt, wear it around the house, whatever. Tony's got kids to put through school. And, Tony, we appreciate you being on the program. And uh, I will be in contact with you probably privately, potentially, about that. I love the, the, the autograph I got the first time I met Andre. I'm not sure I love it ten or $12,000 worth. Jim, we'll see you're what right. happens. It is May 12th. I'm sorry. You're oh, right for on, the, on that date. It is May 12th. <laughs> you're just, you're dismissed. Brian, cut the cord. Well, we are back on the program now. And Brian, I don't know that Tony really realizes that not only did he give his office phone number out to a lot of people, but also he probably just spoke to more people at one time that have an Andre the Giant autograph than probably any other audience that he might be able to get involved with. And many of those people are now planning on calling him this week to determine if they can send their kids through college on the Andre plan. What do you think? Let's imagine if you're like Andre's daughter, you could just release one autograph a week for the rest of your life. If you have them on hand. Well, but I, comfortably. 
I'm not sure since he's been gone for 30 years that he she's got a stack of like 500 <laughs> eight by tens that he pre-signed for just such an occasion. But they ain't making any more Andre autographs. I guess that's the point. So in terms of the collectible Andre autograph, Tony spoke about Jean Ferre. Of course, that's his name when he came over to North America. Andre the Giant, not as rare as that. Still hard to get. Andre Rusimov is probably the hardest one, right? I would think because that would have been what he would have signed on only official documents. He would not have ever signed a fan's autograph. I don't, I don't say ever, but maybe early in his career and, you know, something like that. But I don't think any of those may have come to light. So, and then I wonder, did he ever sign the monster Rusimov? You know, that's how I first heard him announced or introduced because remember before Vince Sr. signed him to a contract and started sending him around, that was 1974, his first national tour of America. But because of the connection with uh, Bruiser and Chicago and Gagne, he not only made shots in the AWA in 1972, but also he came to Indianapolis. It was either 72 or 73. And famously, the story was he, he was in Montreal as Jean Ferre, but Dick the Bruiser heard it as Giant Ferry and said, we can't call this guy Giant Ferry. And they his first time in Indianapolis, he was billed as the Monster Rusimov, which sounded even fucking cooler to me, right? Sounded like a goddamn Russian. It is pretty badass. Um, and then, you know, things say he left Montreal, so Jean Ferre, the people un there understood it, but John the Man of Iron, mythological French-Canadian lumberjack or whatever. But uh, they pretty quickly settled on Andre the Giant. Simple, but the right move. The right name. So 11 by 17 in color... To me, <laughs> ah, I got to get me a velvet rope. Anyway, you know what? I need somebody to talk to. Yeah, Tony's going to need someone to talk to after all the phone calls he's about to get from fake Andre the Giants in the next week. Well, he's not going to need anybody to talk to. He's going he's, he's to have all the people that he wants to talk to. for the, He loves talking about wrestling collectibles. But folks, if you love talking to somebody about Ways that you can improve yourself, that you can improve your life, that you can make yourself feel better. A journey of self-discovery, as the material says here. Then we, as we often do, suggest the folks over at BetterHelp. This program is sponsored by BetterHelp, as many of them are. And BetterHelp, as we've mentioned, is an entirely online therapy service designed to be convenient, flexible, suited to your schedule. You can go to betterhelp.com slash JCE and you fill out a brief questionnaire and you can get matched up with a licensed therapist that you can switch anytime. There's no additional charge for that. But as they say, therapy is about deepening your self-awareness and understanding. Maybe, Brian, we might know a couple of people that might avail themselves of that service. But sometimes you just need somebody to talk to, not necessarily to tell you what to do, but to listen until you figure it out or point you in the right direction. And BetterHelp will connect you with that licensed therapist who can take you on that journey from wherever you are to wherever you want to go. And Brian, it's like, you know, when my grandfather, he went to the doctor and the doctor recommended that he walk a mile a day. And two weeks later, we didn't know where the hell he was. Oh, if on. you don't know where the hell you are in life, try better help. Give them a try. Many of the Cult of Coordinate listeners have said that they have bettered themselves by better help. So go to betterhelp.com slash JCE right now. You're going to get 10%. Well, not right now. Finish the program. But later on today, you're going to get 10% off your first month's services. Better help, H E L P dot com slash jce 10 percent off your first month's services because this is tax time and people may need some counseling if for no other reason than that 
I know somebody had to talk you down off your fucking roof earlier today, Brian. I've been on the it ground was the neighbors because it was the neighbors because you were naked. <laughs> what have you heard? Well, I know you don't like those tan lines, and it is now coming on summer. Anyway, so speaking of taxing situations and potential situations where we might need to talk to somebody to make ourselves feel better afterwards, did you watch AEW for this past Wednesday night, April the 12th? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on? What are they doing? I, I, this was... At a certain point, it's not they, it's he. It, well, hey, the collective they, the royal we, the fuck you, whatever past tense, present tense, future tense, we need to talk about this. This was rough to watch. And... You know, the, the first 30 seconds of the opening match was probably the best 30 seconds of AEW television I've seen in a while from a wrestling standpoint. But it was only 30 seconds out of a two-hour program. The first match, and help me with this, Brian, it was Darby Allen versus Swerve Strickland. Prince Nana was in Swerve's corner. Well, he, was, he wasn't in the corner. Prince Nana and Brian Cage came out with swerve and then went back and then later on both of them ran back out again but part of, the, swerve, part of the wonderful character development they've done for the prince nana character on aew tv well that's why we, he, we saw him here on the opening match and then he actually got to speak a sentence later on but has swerve strickland had a singles match on dynamite and if so in the last six to nine months it's been a while I mean, not since him and Keith Lee broke up. And that was a while ago. And you know, those crazy kids, I thought they had a great future together. And then we started hearing, because I'm not even sure, I guess we were doing the ratings then. He was one of the people that, for whatever reason, moved the ratings, and then he was off Dynamite for months. And the Rick Ross thing fizzled out. <laughs> the other two tattooed guys, I don't know where they were this week. I forgot about them again. Well, anyway, here's what I... Stop. Hold on. What? In your own words, <laughs> explain to me the last six months of everything with Keith Lee and Swerve. Because it was only a few things we've seen on TV, so six months is basically three episodes. I, d I don't know. I don't know. They were... They did. They were a team out of the blue or either didn't want to be a team to begin with, but then they were, but they only teamed like a couple of times and then they broke up, but we weren't sure which one turned on the other, right? And am I hitting it so far? And then Rick Ross had the segment where him and Keith Lee were in the ring. He called him a big motherfucker. Big motherfucker, yeah. <laughs> and they all got lost for some unknown reason. And everybody was fucking twisting in the wind. And then... They've been mad at each other since then, probably on YouTube. And I know that, you know, I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. But I've had Darby Allen. I've said, you know, he, he, here is what I wrote because I wanted to watch this match because, okay, we haven't seen Swerve in a singles match before. We've said, hey, the guy's got some personality. He's done a good promo, he, whatever. So I watched Swerve, Darby out of the pillars that they expect to work with MJF, he's the guy. So here's what I wrote on their entrances. I said, Darby Allen has charisma, and we know about his ability, his judgment-making of about all of his daredevil business aside with a focused push and booking from the start. I would have no problem with the way that the fans like him and that the promos that he's been doing lately, you can put him in a singles pay-per-view title match and i think people would buy it that's of course with all those things focus push a, a good booking from the start he'd been ready by now or before now but i got no problem with especially with mjf it's not like mjf is the size of the goddamn undertaker so i can buy that right so that's fine with me and when swerve came out he acts like he's somebody that's half the battle uh, he hasn't been exposed or pushed in a major way as a single on this television program ever. 
And then suddenly, because there is a grudge from whatever the fuck they've all been doing on all their other programs and nobody watches, they start hot and Darby uncorked one of those flipping stunners, boom, and swerve goes to the floor and Darby hits the ropes, the fastest dive I've ever seen, like a bullet, over the bottom rope, straight into fucking swerve. Oh, wow, that was exciting. And then a cannonball off the top to the floor on Swerve. And about, wow, this guy's a human pinball. If he'd have thrown him in the ring and they'd have had a match where we could tell whether anybody was worth a shit from there or not, it would have been lovely. But what happened was then Swerve leg sweeps Darby on the apron and just cut the heel, just cuts the baby face off, face to face, no heelishness. And then hits a full scoop slam on the floor. Then goes to climb up on the rail, but Darby knocks him off the rail and hangs him out to dry like Ain't Lola's wash on the railing and then throws him into the rail. And suddenly now he's fine again after these bumps and this full scoop slam. And then Darby tried to pull Swerve up on the metal stairs, but Swerve gave him a flat back bump on the stairs. And then I'm writing now, they've been on the floor the entire match. Who's the referee? Oh, Brie. And she's just staring as they're on the foot. Now, maybe about three minutes later, they roll in the ring. And then Swerve takes Darby's belt out of his pants and is whipping the bejesus out of him while Aubrey is there stomping her hoof and making mean faces. And not do anything about it. There's no disqualification. And it's not like they've announced this as a no DQ match. She just doesn't call it disqualification. And then Darby leg dives swerve and throws fake punches at, at his general direction on the mount. It just, it, they started out exciting and Darby's got this energy and the people like him. And then the, it turned into every indie match from you would think people that don't know any better and i know that darby's had good matches and they've got agents if they'd listen to them i don't know whether they are or not swerve takes darby's neck chain that he's crazy for wearing because he's gonna hang it on something one of these days and puts it in his mouth and chokes him in front of the referee and by this point they've slowed down because they started at 100 miles an hour, and once they did every big bump and floor move they could and got in the ring, they're choking each other. So we started at 100 miles an hour, and now we're rapidly running out of fucking gas. And they go to the floor for the break. And when they come back, Swerve's getting some heat on Darby. At least they're in the ring. But we're only 10 minutes into the fucking show, and it seemed like a while. So Swerve's getting the heat on Darby and suddenly he stops and starts to get up on the second rope like he's going to come off the second turnbuckle. And then he says, no, he steps out and he goes to the top rope, but he takes forever to get up to the top by, he does, by the time he does, rather. Darby tripped him and hung Swerve upside down and took off Swerve's shoe and sock and bit his foot to start his comeback. And it wasn't even as exciting as it sounds. And then he, they went into a leg lock. And then they did the yay boo. Boom, boom, boom. And then they started doing shit suddenly at 100 miles an hour that you couldn't tell who was giving it and who was taking it. And I'm like, how have they... Did they see this match in their heads? Did someone lay this out for them? And, and what was their opinion? Did they think this was all a good idea? They took about 30 seconds to set up a deal where Darby was doing a shoulder ride on Swerve on the apron, where Swerve turned... Darby's sitting like a chicken fight on his shoulders, and Swerve turns to face the ring while he's standing on the apron. So the only thing that was possible was Darby to give him a reverse Hurricane Rana off the apron of the floor. And that's where we, the letter we read earlier in the program, again, 
that, you know, that's three feet, but going backwards, being flipped with a guy around your neck. And then Nana's there. When Darby hits the coffin drop, he covers him and Nana puts Spears' uh, or not Spears, but uh, Swerve's foot on the ropes. And Darby r r rolls out of the ring and walks menacingly up the ramp after Nana, who's backpedaling up to the entranceway, until here comes that numbnuts Brian Cage, walks out, and he points to the ring and tells Darby, get back in the ring, and Darby does. He turns around and goes back to the ring. Suitably chastened, I might add. And I wrote, my God, this is fucking rotten. And I'm skipping to the finish. And I zipped ahead a minute or two, and Darby won with a kind of a step over leg lock and a bridge, almost like, but not as good as the Gibson leg lock that Ricky and Robert Gibson used to use. But can you explain to me what was going on with this match? And we still don't know whether Swerve can work because he didn't show us any here. And what the fuck was going on, Brian? I enjoyed it for what it was because I kind of figured it would be this and this is what these guys do. This was their match. I mean, this was what I'm not surprised. I mean, you seem surprised by this match. I, I, I don't, I just thought that it might, I thought these were two of the better ones of the modern kind. These two guys have worked together a lot. So, I mean, th when I say this oh, is their boy. match, this is their oh, match. Boy. You mean, I, I would have said, okay, Swerve hasn't had a single match. Maybe they've never been to ring with each other. You keep saying that. We've seen him as a single. Well, but I mean, on Dynamite or what, I don't recognize. You don't remember it. That says more about it than anything. It. Yeah. Well, but hadn't had many. But the point is, I thought they could do better than this. I can't believe they've been in the ring together before. So, we were close to 20 minutes into the program by that point, And then Darby's sitting in the ring selling. You know, he's, he's won. The heels disappeared wherever they went. And then suddenly MJF's music plays. And here he comes. So, we go to the break while he's coming to the ring. Darby's still in the ring. So we come back, they're going to do the in-ring promo. And Darby had put his homeless willy jacket back on, that dirty fucking canvas thing he wears with the hood, but he's sitting on his ass in the corner while his nemesis is on the microphone berating him. I guess, well, I guess maybe that fits his, what was he called, a brooding emo twink? It fits his brooding emo twink image, I guess. I don't fucking know what all these different nicknames are. <laughs> but anyway, what? Nothing, go ahead. <laughs> well, anyway, so he's sitting on his ass in the corner, but MJF's on the microphone. He's all dressed up, suit and the Burberry and the whatever. And he cuts the promo and reminds Darby that he beat him with a headlock takeover at their pay-per-view in 2021. Of course, he knocked him out with the dynamite diamond, I think, right before that. And he said, he said, you are not on the level of the devil. But then, and you know, and I was expecting MJF's outburst to be the highlight of this, but when Darby responded, he remember, was it a couple of weeks ago when he fired up and actually... Yeah, when he had the, all four of them in the ring at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and well, he did the same thing. He's doing great. And his story is that he doesn't love material things. And he, and he talks about checking himself into therapy. And uh, while MJF is talking about loving money and cutting people's balls off to, to get it, and he still he leads a miserable life. Do you know, this is the flair and dusty polar opposite dichotomy, juxtaposition, whatever the proper phraseology would be, that they talked about on the Dusty biography. You had two guys on opposite ends, of the Jack Webb and Keith Richards. Flair was the kiss dealing, wheeling dealing, limousine riding, jet fine, custom made from head to toe, diamond rings, Cadillacs, blah, blah, blah. Dusty was the common man, the working man. Hard times promo. I started to say good times. Good old hard times. The point is, this is the same <laughs> thing, but for an updated audience. MJF is that entitled, you know, rich 
you know, successful millennial prick and Darby is this fucking weirdo. I don't know. It's not my generation, but I can see where his fans fucking like him for not wanting money and checking himself into therapy and working everything out and whole nine yards. And he feels it's authentic. The, yes. He said with his AEW money, he bought his parents a house and helped his dad retire. So I, the point is, I can see he's doing a great job verbally. Who would have thought it? Cinderella story out of nowhere. And I can see him connecting, especially with the AEW audience demographic like this. And he had the fans chanting Darby. So they've got something with these two. If they continue to try to, and they were having cutaways of Sammy and his his Ty Melo Conti uh, watching the monitors and Jungle Jack, Jungle Jim. If they continue to try to put those two in this situation, it's going to muddy it. They've got something with MJF and Darby. And MJF got back in his face and told him, morals kill careers. And uh, I'm tired of you and Jack. And Sammy whining about my conduct and blah, blah, blah. I could give a shit if I go to heaven. Well, now, see, he's Jewish, right? So that doesn't count anyway. Where do you guys go? We go to heaven. What the hell are you talking about? I don't know. I, that's a Where do you think I've you're going? You. Where do you think you're going? I'm going under the dogwood tree. You sure are. Well, that's, that's I've made my plans. I don't know where you... But I didn't know if there was a different fucking category that y'all was a part of. Trying to learn these things. We're all a, a part of the kingdom of heaven. Except for the people that's oh going my to the God. dogwood tree. You hear that? It's like a thunderstorm that just broke out outside <laughs> as soon as I said that. That's well, not good. See now. That's not maybe, a good sign. Maybe there are other plans for you you're not aware of. I'll be over here now. That's your patented line. Anyway, back in the back in the action here. MJF could give a shit if he goes to heaven. He's willing to do whatever it takes. And Darby, your legacy is going to be Darby Allen Sting's bitch. And I have, to this point, I thought this has been great. And then Sting's music plays. And Sting comes out, and suddenly the mood in the ring, and I'm not knocking Sting. He's got to be Sting. Sting didn't need to be in this for Darby's sake. I know Tony is a Sting mark, and people want to see Sting. I'd be happy to see Sting somewhere else, but not right in the middle of this, right at this moment, because the mood changed. Darby just walked back over to the corner. Sting took center stage. He's the big star. He's been Darby's mentor, but goddamn, I think we've kind of passed that point. We've got Darby face to face in the ring with the world champion. And Sting, the first thing he does, because he's been called Darby's cheerleader or whatever, and maybe because there was a stock room in the back and he saw some shit and had an idea, he pulls pom-poms out of his jacket and slaps MJF in the face with him and throws them at him and kills the heat that MJF had just built. And now MJF is looking like the kid that was on the indies a couple of years ago because he's in the ring with a universally recognized wrestling star that's making smart ass remarks to him and not showing not only not fear but not any resentment toward the comments that he's made and he's, he's always just, been better off the mic he's making fun of the world champion and the comments that he made that were supposed to be so deeply disturbing to Darby Allen and then they, and because I know if, if somebody came up with this verbiage, or maybe it was Tony's himself, but they wanted to drop Cody's name. Because since MJF is blistering Darby for having Sting as his backup and his big brother, and, and that's what he looked like here, his big brother, then instead of Daddy Daycare, Sting said, oh, Cody Daycare. Oh, oh, did I say Cody? He was your support system. It didn't need to, to go that direction. Yeah, now, what the you, fuck? What are they doing? Completely lost the plot, lost the fucking moment of MJF and Darby, and it's become Sting bringing up that Cody's gone as a way to make mockery of MJF and take the heat off of him he just built. 
So then it became, and then Sting is, it's all a promo about Sting's gimmicks. When I was the crow, hey, shout out Rick, he shouted out Ric Flair for making him a star. And the NWO, hey, thanks, Kevin and Scott. Yeah, he did Ric Flair's Hall of Fame speech for Muda. It was all about him. Yes. And he made sure to say, I don't want the world title because showtime is about over. But I'm just, it's just starting for Darby and he'll become world champion. One of these, he talked to MJF like he was a punk kid. He talked about Darby like he was defending his little buddy or little brother and took uh, attention onto Cody and Flair and Hall and Nash and distracted from the heat that MJ, the, uh, some level of legitimate passion that MJF and Darby had created for themselves, uh, conflict there. It just went a completely different direction. If they had gone from, Darby, your legacy is going to be being Sting's bitch to Darby saying, I'm going to be the bitch that beats you, bitch, to then what MJF did finally was after Sting's haranguing of him, he walked up and spit in Darby's face and bailed out, and Sting wasn't involved. That would have been a fine interview with me if you'd had MJF and Darby booked for a world title match on a pay-per-view and you did that a week or two ahead of time. But... I don't think Darby is, is at the point where he needs a 63-year-old mentor speaking for him or even representing him anymore if, he, if they're going to put him in this position. What do you think? I like the match. And then the post-match with MJF and Darby, I really liked. As you said, Darby has really stepped it up on the mic. I really enjoyed all this. As soon as Sting came out, when Sting came out, that should have been the end. You know, like you said, he could have spit in his face there. Even leave it at your Sting's bitch and let Darby do something. But that should have been the end. And then it went on for a while longer. So it ends up feeling like it went on too long. And then it's Sting. And Sting's never been good on the mic, like I said earlier. So now he's out there dressing down the world champion. They'll probably try to justify with MJF kicking the shit out of Sting backstage or something at some point. But it doesn't justify it. And... I want to get your take on this. I know that everyone knows that he was one of the founders of the company. He's EVP. And Tony Khan brought him up when making the Wembley announcement. But is it smart to be bringing up Cody Rhodes in the middle of something like this? No. Because, again, <laughs> Cody, the guy who left... The guy who was MJF's mentor. Now, suppose the story would have been if, and they were already starting to tell it, that MJF came out from under Cody's influence and became his own guy, and eventually MJF would have decisively beaten Cody, blah, blah, blah. But now you've reminded them that, well, the guy that left was just in the main event of WrestleMania facing the biggest star in the business for the biggest title in the business, and... Meanwhile, his former protege is over here. He's the world champion of this company where <laughs> the guy that used to be the champion in WCW 30 years ago is talking for the fucking guy that wants to challenge for it. I... <clears throat> On TV for the first like three months of the company, Cody and MJF were friends. Yeah. So you have to be someone who was watching the first few months of TV leading into MJF turning on Cody to even know what any of this is about. And again, it's about Cody. It's about another company's main eventer throwing him into this. Unnecessary. MJ and and, and, and I'll say one more thing. What you said about Sting, is it's never been his forte, the you know long soliloquy promos. But I, sometimes if something comes to his mind and, or he can't remember exactly where he's going next, he'll just blurt something out to get himself in the mood for it. I don't even know if they knew he was going to talk about, hey, Kevin, Scott, whatever the fuck. He just probably... He was in that, but no. And we were 35 minutes into the program by the time the Derby match and all these promos ended. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, you know what? I do come out of this. I wish Sting wasn't involved just because I think it does muddy this. But I do come out of this wanting to see, to your point earlier, Darby versus MJF. I've been very complimentary of Sammy's stuff recently, but I'd rather see Darby MJF right now. I think you're right. Instead Darby's, of the four-way, they're going to do. 
And so Darby's got the people naturally because they like him and he's got that charisma. And that's, again, when he did the dive, like the bullet-like dive, and I criticized so much that they did because they, my God, it was like you've beaten someone with a sledgehammer for the first two minutes and now we're going to go grab a leg lock. It just at least put the fucking sledgehammer at the end. But the thing is, if if they weren't allowing everybody who possibly can to do the dives and the flips and the death-defying things, then when Darby Allen, the little undersized underdog guy, but with the charisma and the speaking ability now and the gimmick and the support from the fans, when he does it, it's going to mean more anyway. So if he's the only one that was doing it or one of the only ones instead of everybody, it would mean so much more. And that's the way you create a, a unique star who was doing shit like tiger mask in Japan when Sayama became tiger mask. Nobody. Exactly. And then they had to bring in the Mexicans and the Europeans and the people from different parts of the the wrestling world to work with him because the Japanese guys couldn't necessarily do that style at that point and all of them hang with him. And they brought in the opponents that he had worked with in his tours of England and his tours of Mexico and they kind of knew the drill and then they trained a few but it was exclusive to him, and he was the biggest attraction in Japanese wrestling. And that's when they had legitimate major national stars in both companies. But when everybody does something, as that now, if anybody did any of Tiger Mask shit, they can't do it as well. But if they did any of it in Japan, now people have seen it for 40 years. It, it's not revolutionary. But that. <clears throat> but with the Pillars anyway. thing, out of the. Other three, he's the one I can actually see having a long-term back and forth. Yeah. Even with Gap's feud with MJF more than Sammy or Jungle Boy. They can, I'm sure they can have some nice spots with Sammy or Jungle Boy in their matches. If they want to draw money, it's Darby Allen. That's just, anyway, let, moving on. Speaking of drawing money, there was an open challenge for the TNT title that our... Our, uh, we're a fan of his, uh, powerhouse Hobbs, one of our chosen ones that we'd like to see more of has won the TNT title. Now and we've talked about how that happened. He had an open challenge and it was answered by Silas young. Cause they were in Milwaukee. I'm not knocking Silas young. He's from Milwaukee. That's why he got the booking. He's it done work for ring of honor. He's been around independence for a long time. But it was not like, it, obviously this was a three-move squash. So it, it's not like they said, hey, Silas, you're an experienced veteran. Come and put this kid over and maybe help lead him. And I'm not saying that they should have Hobbs going five to seven minutes competitively with an experienced veteran if he's never been on fucking television before for AEW, which Silas Young has not, to my knowledge. But the problem has become now that they are continuing to surround Hobbs with QT and Solo. I don't know where Komoroto and Agogo went. They went, went. And the, the QTV girl. And as soon, Hobbs looks great. He's got a great entrance, the, the lighting and the blah, blah, blah. And he looks great. And then suddenly here comes QT and another job guy that nobody really recognizes on site and some nameless girl. And they come down with him and you know not to care. And then he's put in the ring with a guy who's already in the ring. We know what that means. And that has never been on this television program before. So, and they showed video of Hobbs pulling up in his brand new car that QT just gave him five days ago, apparently on the Friday program, they said. And the announcers are talking about how much he loves that car, like it's his goddamn dog that he's had for 10 years. It's like the booker is nine years old and we couldn't see this coming. The only reason they put him out there and even gave him a win in a, a pesky little nuisance thing like a match 
to get your champion over against a guy that the vast majority of the audience has never heard of before was just to get him out there and establish the car on screen. So as soon as Hobbs beat Silas Young in three moves, and by the way, the best part of the fucking match was a sign in the crowd that said, stop trying to make QT happen. Apparently that was a listener of the show because there was another sign that they said, uh, I believe it's the same person, that they said security took away. And it was QTV is a result of bad creative. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, Hobbs wins with a power bomb. And then for whatever reason, QT and powerhouse uh, grab Silas Young and attempt to drag him up the entrance way. What were they going to go fucking grind him up and sell his fucking fat for soap? What? Why were they dragging him away with him? Like, oh, goddamn, now he's our drunk friend at the party. We got to take him home. And suddenly on the screen, there is Wardlow standing next to Powerhouse's Hobbs's car that he's had for five days that they just showed a video of him arriving in right before he got in the ring for this squash match. How many times do they show people pulling up in their brand new car right before a squash match, Brian? Never that I can think of. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So there's Wardlow, and he's got a pipe, and he busts the car up with a pipe. And then he takes a rope stanchion, because the car is not even in the parking lot. They've done a gimmick where Hobbs intimidated the valet parking guy, so there is a literally a velvet rope and two rope stanchions sitting in front of this car that's in the middle of a parking lot around nothing else. And then he goes and walks over, and there just happens to be a forklift. <laughs> With the keys in it, apparently. That's right. <laughs> sitting in this empty parking lot next to this car that's been roped off by a five-foot velvet rope. And it takes forever because those forklifts are not sports cars. They don't move quickly. But he gets the forklift while back in the arena, they're just watching this on the monitor or on the screen. I would assume by the time that the forklift pulled up, Hobbs could have been out there. But nevertheless, he turns the car over with the forklift. So back in the arena, Hobbs naturally figures, I'll get even for him doing that by power bombing Silas Young off the stage onto two carefully prearranged tables that are sitting off the side of the stage. But as they set up and get ready to do that, Wardlow's music plays in the arena, and naturally, even though he's nowhere around, he the guy that Hobbs already has a hold of that he could just throw, he lets him go, and they look around for Wardlow. Until here comes Wardlow. And they have, and when I use the term big pull apart, this was the best part of this segment but still it wasn't what i would call a big pull apart they have a pull apart with the agents and job guys where neither one of them ever even went down or left their feet they just punched each other until people pull them back and then they punch each other again and boom and then hobbs just left and you you see him with a couple of people on the left side of the screen and he's not really protesting he just turns around and goes down the entrance way and wardlow Grab Solo and picks him up for a power bomb. And remember, I mentioned the prearranged tables off the side of the deal. Did you catch how Mr. Solo landed on those tables or <laughs> that table, Brian? I did see that, yes. He went, they're two, they're sitting two side by side crossways from him and he goes completely through the first one the closest <laughs> one to him but the only part of him that even touched the second one was the back of his fucking head so the second one didn't break or even give and if it had been one would assume either an inch off north or south or maybe just even it just wasn't his time to die. It should have broken his, snapped his neck, severed his spinal cord. That's a lot more than a three-foot fall off a front porch when a six-and-a-half-foot guy is power-bombing you off a raised stage through a fucking lunchroom table. 
but he didn't put him quite far enough. So, but like we said, one table at least broke. So the fans didn't set the seats on fire, but the brain damage that the back of his head got off the second table, we may have to, <clears throat> I don't know, revisit that in 15 or 20 years when he can't remember his own zip code. And none of it means anything. There's no point to it. It's at the point now where it's just another pop. I mean, you're doing it to Solo, who no one cares about. So you're just trying to get the pop of someone going through a table. But we see it every week, so it's not a big deal anymore. Yeah. Hobbs, whenever we talked about him for maybe a year and a half, him and Starks were together, then they feuded. The only thing I can remember you maybe saying is he could use a mouthpiece. It was never, let's put him in a faction with job people. And QT Marshall would be the mouthpiece. If you're no. trying to get him over, which it seemed like they were ready to do something with him, why would you do this? The sign in the crowd was the most accurate thing. And you could apply a lot of people to it. Stop trying to make QT Marshall a thing. Because he's been there a long time. And to the best of my knowledge, no one's clamoring for more. And all it has done is taken Hobbs down a step. If Hobbs and them could stand in the ring and watch the monitor of Wardlow destroying the car, but no one could run out there to try and stop him. How the hell did he get back in so quickly? <laughs> Should have been the same amount of time, shouldn't it, that it would have taken them to get there? No, he did the Hogan thing. He went with the international date line around the <laughs> cir circumference of the world. I guess so, so. at the equator. Le okay, and let me just ask then, when I've said, you said yes, I said with a mouthpiece, because that he has intensity, but he needs someone to talk him up. I agree with making Wardlow part of a package with someone at ringside, but it, it, I wasn't talking about... Wardlow or Hobbs? Or, I'm sorry, Hobbs. Hobbs. I'm, Hobbs with a, with a manager, but I'm not talking about people that have already been pigeonholed as underneath, preliminary, middle card, whatever. Imagine, I know it's not ever going to happen, but a powerhouse Hobbs with a weekly push of wins and domination and physical presence while Paul Heyman was just doing three minutes a week of talking about him and what you'd have after three months or so. That's what I'm talking about. But that's the problem with these managers a lot of the time. I'm considering QT a manager. You need to talk about and talk up the wrestler. It should yeah. be about nothing else. That's what Heyman does perfectly. But see, that well, because QT is one of the people that fucking sits in with Tony and helps him do his paperwork and arrange his columns, apparently they've somehow convinced Tony that the idea is that QT will help get Hobbs over and be, being around QT, because I, I, I don't know any other way to explain this. Nobody wants to see any of this. It's self-indulgent and ridiculous. Anyway, I wrote at that point, I don't honestly know if I can watch any more of this, but there was more to come. Um, and I will agree with you. Now that I've heard Juice Robinson talk, he does have a weird, a weird voice and a weird face in kind of a good heel way. Uh, he's partners with Jay White now. I heard Jay White speak, and he's more juice. <laughs> well yeah jay jay white pronounced all the words right it, it didn't knock me out or make me guffaw but i'd like to hear juice more because he was the one that stood out and does anybody give a shit about the bullet club anymore is that even a thing that is popular now or are they trying to redo it here or is it still a thing that's happening and most people just don't know it, or is it going to matter in the United States? Has it ever mattered to anybody but the buckaroos and their ilk? I've been saying it's the lamest thing since like 2018 or 19, <laughs> so I may not be the best person to ask this, but it is so lame that this thing still exists, and both these guys would be better off in America not associating with that. With that said, it probably only exists, though, because it's still selling t-shirts, because that was really the primary reason for the whole thing, but... No, I don't think anyone here Okay, well, then, well, hold on and tell me this. Do, do the average... Well, maybe the question I'm about to ask, if, if any average wrestling fan, just casual fan, watched AEW, which they probably don't, but, like, if any of the WWE viewers happen to check in one, one day with the other programming, 
Would they know the Bullet Club is from Japan? Would they know what the Bullet Club is? Has anybody on AEW television ever tried to explain what the Bullet Club is or who's in the Bullet Club currently? No, and McFinger Bang's the only one that actually makes the gesture of the gun going off, so you would think he's the leader of the Bullet Club. And he, But he never wears the Bullet Club t-shirt, does he? Well, he's not in it anymore. They left and did their own thing. Oh, so he's just, he's a, he's a loose pistol now. Just firing his blanks everywhere. And Billy Gunn, he used to have a gun, too. Firing well, his blanks and, and everywhere. I heard Janie had one at one point. I wish she'd have shot her. Janie's got a gun. I wish she'd have shot her while she was working in the WCW office. Hello, Janie Engel, if you're out there, we love you. Anyway, so they did an interview. I don't know. What the fuck? All right. And then the hits just keep on coming. Apparently, I have poisoned the career of Buddy. What is his name? Buddy Matthews? Buddy Murphy? Buddy Matthews now. He used to be Buddy Murphy, and then he was also Murphy. Okay, but Buddy Sorrell. He could, he could use that one, couldn't he? Apparently, because I said something good about him, now they've deter they're determined to bury this guy. Because it was Buddy, he's still in the House of Black, and that's a shame. But he's in a singles match, and he comes out with Julia Hart. And uh, somebody on Twitter last week said, Cornette, are you crazy? Because I said Julia Hart could be a fucking star. She's got a great look. You put her in a fucking gimmick, a package, whatever. They they said, have you seen her wrestling? I'm not talking about as a fucking wrestler. No, the one thing Julia Hart, if I was booking her, would never do is fucking wrestle. She would come out looking like that. The occult theme, little witchcraft, little Stevie Nicks, some spells, the fog and the blackness. She would never wrestle, but she would be what? Just your description of everything. You always have to throw Stevie Nicks in there. Well, that's what she's doing. And, but anyway, but that's the thing. As a as a manager, valet, sorceress, whatever, put her and with Buddy even because I said with with an ath what an athlete he is, right? And he looks great with a manager, a name, and a gimmick. If he can talk, he could have the sorceress manager that can't really do a promo she could say certain things and get by with it if he can't talk then that's where a fucking want to be happy Heyman might come into play but you could make money with this fucking guy and especially if he had a good producer where he i don't know what his background and training is on how he would logically put a match together but there's material here to work with and they send this guy and this girl out for the intercontinental title with fucking dipshit, our little puppy pockets. And obviously I did not dignify this by watching it because seriously, this joke has long since played out, but counting his entrance and the match, the waste of flesh not only took up 15 minutes of television time, but they went across the top of the nine o'clock hour. And, to nobody's surprise, this giant, jacked-up, muscle, muscular fucking athlete, 6'2", 3", 4", 250 pounds or whatever, with this drop-dead, gorgeous, star-looking fucking girl in the corner, got beat by a car wash attendant. <sighs> Your thoughts? I thought this was great. <laughs> because it gave me a chance to leave the office for 15 minutes and go get something to eat. All right. So I'm not going to watch. No, listen, you said it. The joke is played out. It's tired. To the people who think Orange Cassidy has somehow evolved into being something different than he always was. <laughs> no, not really. And I didn't like what he always was anyway. Well, you know what? It's like the fish down at the bottom of that underground lake in Mammoth Cave. Over the millions of years, they've evolved because they never see light where they don't have eyes. So they've evolved, but they're still ugly fucking pieces of shit. Well, I don't know about that, but this is Tony's little toy. This is his favorite toy. And he's not going to give up on it. That's why I will say it again. I'm afraid he's going to try to do eventually Orange Cassidy and MJF for the title. Does he have to kill all of his potential good talent that might ever do something for him? Or can he just, well, I was going to say he could feed 
pockets various members of the Puddin gang, but they're his friends. Horrible. Yeah. There was another spooky video of Christian Cage and Dino Douche, but this time Christian spoke and said some things have changed. And that's it. So they're milking this for a while, but if I can see more Christian, I'm for it, whether he's talking or working. He got something out of the dinosaur for a couple weeks as a heel, but I don't trust Dino to not revert to his previous ways and start having the matches he normally had, which all sucked. Anyway, Is Christian not wrestling? Is Christian just a manager? Well, he's dressed in street clothes, but, you know, it's hard to get dinosaur-sized suit jackets for, you know, the fucking 40-million-year-old crowd. Did you see Renee, Renee Moxley good with the Puddin' Gang in the back and Pockets was putting an ice pack on his fist? It probably got severe fucking cramps and ligature damage from constant masturbation. And then... We had the other page in the ring doing a promo. And of course, that's an immediate sign to fast forward. But then here comes Matt Hardy and Isaiah Cassidy. So I hit the second notch on made it fast forward fast. <laughs> I mean, they were trying to explain whatever nonsense they've been doing lately. Where remember again, that was a deal where, well, now wait a minute. Did Matt and Isaiah turn on the page and the other guys? Or did who turned on who? And why should we care? So apparently Matt Hardy and Isaiah Cassidy have decided that they want to leave and be done with Stokely Hathaway and the other page. But the other page says, well, there's more people in, what is their name? The Firm? The Firm. Which was, at one point, wasn't it... Uh, the Guns? No. Yeah? No, listen to me. The Firm was Eric Clapton... And was it uh, the the firm? It was Eric Clapton, and I'm trying to think. Was it Robert Palmer? They had one hit single. Nevertheless, this firm. There's more than one person in that too. And here came Big Bill and Lee Moriarty, and they jumped Matt Hardy and Isaiah Cassidy. And I wrote, "Fuck every job guy in the company does angles on this television." If every segment is everybody up and down the card, whether they're meaningless or not, constantly jumping each other and just kicking the shit out of each other back and forth, you have you have nothing. And these heels, the heat looked horrible. And the fans were on their hands because nobody cared about any of these guys. And suddenly Hook's music played. And here in street clothes by himself, walking down the ramp, Hook is going to confront Big Bill, the seven-foot giant, Lee Moriarty, the other page, Stokely Hathaway. And, of course, they each ran at him one at a time so he could do a choreographed thing, but they stopped him seconds later. And people still don't really give a shit. And then Jeff Hardy's music plays. And instantly, the place blows. They go crazy. They hit their feet. They're standing up. And he hits the ring, and it doesn't look necessarily pretty, and they don't care. He beats up the heels. He hits a swanton, and he hugs Matt Hardy, and the place is going berserk. And I can't believe <laughs> that not only has Tony fucked this up uh, again, but in exactly the same way as he fucked it up the first time. He has reunited the Hardys against people that nobody gives two dog shits about. And to be honest, I don't even think they particularly cared or were caring that he reunited the Hardys. I think they were happy Jeff Hardy was back. And he could have hugged Matt or he could have hugged Bozo the Clown or Randy Atcher. It wouldn't have made any difference. They, they have a new singles main event babyface that they could use sparingly in, so to protect his physical well-being in important 
singles matches on pay-per-view or a highly rated television program, they could build three of them over the next six months with a couple of little angles, a couple of live interviews, and a fucking payoff to each one of them. And they could make money out of Jeff Hardy. But instead, he runs out in a meaningless angle involving every miscellaneous jobber in the company and his own brother, who has become one of same. And unless this is going to be just the way they reintroduce him and then he goes on to specific targeted angles with main event guys that he can they can control his level of punishment in and frequency of if they instead just put him in tag matches or in a rivalry with this jobber stew they have again been handed an amazing box office attraction and shot it in the nuts in the same night your thoughts well, let me just start by saying I personally don't think they should have brought Jeff Hardy back after the last incident. And with that said, now that they have, I agree with what you said before. I don't think there was any fan in that building that saw this as a big Hardy Brothers reunion. It was Jeff Hardy running out there. So if he is going to be used, I don't even think about it in that context. It was the same people, the same situation that they debuted him the first time. Yeah. And I didn't like that first run. So now he's a little bit older. Because you can't start in the middle and then go to the top when you're already as over as you're ever going to be the first time they see you. Yeah, I mean, there was a one meme going around of Jeff Hardy standing on a rope and Matt Hardy looking at him, and it said, the look you get when, what was it? The look when you find your meal ticket, whatever it was. <laughs> uh, I'm not excited about Jeff Hardy returning. I'm not excited about seeing the Hardy brothers in tag team action again. Originally, the plan, they said, was for them to get the tag titles before everything went down with Jeff. And now they're all mixed up with this. It's Hook, Ethan Page, Stokely, who hasn't been on TV in a few weeks, Big Bill in the firm, and Private Party. I don't know how much Jeff Hardy has left in the tank. And again, I personally wouldn't have brought him back. But if you're going to, why use him like this? That reaction, they got... Uh, why use him like this? Exactly. They have something that uh, that if they don't wear it out or screw it up would last for six months to a year over a course of, like I said, two to three to four to five big major matches and maximize his value and not wear his body out and not wear his welcome out. Or you can start him with a bunch of job guys and see how far you get. But uh, the one thing they did right was they ran him out... <laughs> They ran him out so the people would pop on the most boring segment of the program, and that's saying something. This was fucking rotten until he got there. Yeah, and again, why are all these people getting so much TV time? QT Marshall and whoever's with him. And then all of a sudden, it's Matt Hardy. It's private. If you say private party, we've seen only one member of private party for as long as I can remember at this point. And not the one that we kind of liked either. Not the one that you said had true talent if you only went yeah. to a good training school. We have seen the firm, all just guys who run out there. And again, there's no development of anyone on any of these things. It's just so many people eating up the TV time that I can't understand why they keep going back to them. It just doesn't make any sense. Well, speaking of eating up some TV time, um, our friend Twinkle Toes Big Finger Bang, good old Kenny Olivier, he had a little sit down VTR interview about the BBC where he's upset that they hurt poor old Don Fallis and how they did. They gave him brain damage. His, his, you know, did you know when he fell, he really legitimately uh, gashed his head wide open, I guess, on a light stand or something. He didn't expect to be there. And, that looked awful. Yeah. Oh. And they, sa they said well, it was like a three-inch cut or whatever. His brain almost actually fell out, that, that cut. That was my intention. Anyway, so... Rocky Five. But, Fortunately, somebody was there to pick it back up and put it back in his head. Well, didn't they take it out first and cleaned it off real good, dusted it off, and then put oh, it back Shibata. in? Oh, Shibata, yeah, and now he's back wrestling. So anyway, the aforementioned BBC then entered through the arena. Boy, they're hot heels with a fun sing-along. I just want to say, I actually thought that was one of Omega's best promos in AEW. It was a different tone. Again, he's not going to do a serious promo as well as 
Others would, but... And there goes the thunder again. I guess I'm saying something oh. blasphemous. But I thought Omega did an all right job on this promo. All I wrote this, this promo was as exciting as watching a bird <laughs> shit. What I wrote. <laughs> or that. Could be, it could go either way. Uh, then here came the BBC, the hot heels with the fun sing-along. Again, they've turned the heel to the point where now they're almost prison raping everybody that comes in their path. But yet the fans pop and cheer because they want to sing the song. Uh, um, so it was Moxley and Claudio with Useless in the corner against, and obviously here was another joke match meant to just get these people in the ring so they could do an angle. The BBC was matched up with Clown Cutlet and Michael Naka 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 to fuck off and get off my television. The Stooges of the Buckaroos and their bonsai, Kenny. And besides the fact that Knock It Off has never been a real wrestler to begin with in the first place, and it's just he's been presented in joke matches, so is Cutlet, Blandon Cutlet, the bland piece of white meat. But he's still wearing the fucking stupid visor and the weird multicolored pajama outfit and nobody even knows what that gimmick is anymore it hadn't been referred to in years i can't remember myself why he put that face thing on but it doesn't matter the the bbc jumped the stooges and beat them up on the floor with chairs and get juice on both of them now the, the again jobber stooges are bleeding and all of it looked like shit because the only one of these five that can work is Claudio. And I thought at one point Cutlet was bleeding and still had the face mask on. And Knock It Off may be worse, as far as a worse wrestler, than Cutlet. And then it went way too long before they beat him, as you knew they would. And then finally Moxley gets on the microphone, and he, he looks, he's almost bald. He's fishy fucking white. He not only has no physique, but he looks like he's never seen the inside of a gym or the outside of the goddamn sun. <laughs> he, looks, he looks literally like Al Bundy in a, in a stupor, and his matches are the shits, and he gets on the microphone, and he's doing the breathing and the blubbering with the sweat, and he instead of saying it's clobbering time, he ought to say it's slobbering time. And as he gets started talking about everything they're going to do to the elite or whatever, the music plays, and here comes Harpo. And he comes down again... <laughs> by himself and this doesn't show bravery on the part of a baby face it shows stupidity you got claudio you got useless you got moxley and here comes kenny and especially when you you've got a guy in the ring it's not going to sell shit you know what moxley you said it off the air yesterday what moxley sees when he looks at himself in the mirror don't you brian what'd you say road warrior moxley yeah, and I said, when I see him, he doesn't look like a road warrior. He looks like a street walker. Road worker, Moxley. A road war <laughs> road worker? Is that what I said? I don't remember, but that's what I see him as now, like wearing a yellow vest on the side of the road, picking up garbage. <laughs> I thought you said road warrior because he won't sell anything. Well, that was what I originally said, but now I'm yeah. thinking road. There goes the thunder again. They're coming for me. You know, you've pissed God off now. I'm telling now if it was possible, I'd have obtained that a long time ago. <laughs> anyway, so Moxley and the BBC are facing the entrance where Olivier is coming from. And they think, of course, you know, he's, he's called, coming by himself. But this time, it's a plot, and the buckaroos come in from behind and hit everybody with super kicks. And then, and of, of course, the Buckaroo fans in the building are popping for this. And Kenny tackles Plumber Moxley and throws what I couldn't count them because they were the little rapid fake girlishness ones, but they're at least three dozen fake punches to Moxley. It looked like a petulant schoolgirl. 
having a temper tantrum. Now we know why he's zero for life in locker room shoots. And then the Bucks gave Moxley the phony looking double knee lift. And then Kenny, they decide to mix up a little drama and intrigue with their violence. Kenny goes out and gets a giant toolbox and comes in the ring and portrays like he's going to go hit Moxley, who's in the corner hanging from the ropes. He's going to hit Moxley with his toolbox. But he doesn't even really get into the milking of it. He just draws it back, and in his blasé, charismaless, personalityless fashion, just holds it there. And then the buckaroos get in and say, stop, stop, and hold their hands up. Like, don't hit him with the toolbox. And then Maddie, the older one of the buckaroos, dramatically pulls out a screwdriver and hands it to Twinkle Toes so that he can stab him with a screwdriver like they were doing to the last week with Paige or whatever. So naturally, their road warrior Moxley then no sells. <laughs> Maddie goes over and kicks him, and Moxley says, get the fuck away from me, and no sells it, and dares Twinkle Toes to come on and stab him in the face. And he's going to stand there and wait for it. Uh, can I stop you real quick? Please do. Despite your feelings about the Bucks and Omega, if they're the baby faces in this, should the heel be acting like that? Nobody should be acting like this. This doesn't make any sense at all to anybody. The alleged baby faces are, even on a tit-for-tat principle, not supposed to stab a man in the face with a screwdriver. And the heel is not supposed to stand there and get the baby face's face and dare him to do it and see what's going to happen to you. So then Kenny charges and stabs the turnbuckle pad, the old Kevin Sullivan spot, when Moxley didn't even duck, Claudio pulled him out by his feet. Moxley was going to take the screwdriver and then probably pull it out of his fucking cranium and stick it up fucking Omega's pee hole or something. And I just wrote, this is so rotten. And it, at least they're going to be fighting each other and we can skip all at the same time. But God almighty, is this... For a guy who, like Moxley, who thinks he's so violent and the BBC being a group founded on violence, why is all of this violence look so fucking phony? It's gotten to the point where it's stupid, because as soon as the music hits, the place pops. Moxley and Claudio and Wheeler walk out, wrapped in security. These badasses. The security- Nobody's trying to get to them. <laughs> With a security everywhere. I used to go down the appropriate fucking approved wrestler's entrance and have six or eight or ten or sometimes twelve cops around me and still get fucking tackled. They can come through the back door with two security guys with a walkie-talkie and emerge unscathed. And then it was Moxley Unleashed. We don't sell anything. We kick ass. We do, like, it's just the same thing every week. Someone will bleed. And it just, it's so lame at this point. And then he no-sells everything. If you think like, okay, he's going to act like that, and the baby faces are going to get anything back, oh no, he's not scared of anything. Not scared of the screwdriver coming at him or anything. <clears throat> I've gotten to the point where I find John Moxley so humorous just because it's the same thing over and over again. Well, I think you ought to switch the screwdriver. Start with the Bloody Mary. The old Andre joke, but you remember that one. No. I what? Didn't. Oh, come on. That was Bobby Heenan's favorite Andre story. Andre gets on the fucking plane first thing in the morning as he's fiddling with the seat extension for big people. They, they need that. He looks up at the, the uh, stewardess and he says, could you bring me a screwdriver? So she comes back a few minutes later, not with a vodka and orange juice, but with an actual tool, a screwdriver. That's what she took it as, that he needed help with the fucking seatbelt. He wanted a screwdriver, vodka and orange juice. So he looks up at her and he said, what would you have brought me if I asked for a Bloody Mary? It's funnier when Bobby told it. You know, we just saw with the bloodline how wrestling fans get excited over a storyline and watching things play out, and at times with that really slowly. How do you think the mudline's doing? Do you think this storyline with the BCC and the elite 
is captivating AEW fans or wrestling fans as a whole? I think the mud line has flatlined. And they're on the way to the unemployment line. And that's where we draw the line. Because now we get to move on. Because Prince Nana got to talk on television. Now he's a manager. We don't have any idea from watching this television program where he came from or what his deal is or how he's financed to do this or anything about the embassy or his group or whatever, but he got 15 seconds and he sounded good. And then Swerve took over and said very little. And Brian Cage stood there, which is the best thing for him to do, and was mute in the whole situation. And Swerve still has old scores he's going to settle. That sounded like some dramatic foreshadowing to me. Did we not see Blue Sky and Riho versus Ruby Soso and Tony Storm with Soraya in the corner last week? No, we didn't. I think they've been mixing it up. We saw Sky Blue versus Ruby Soho. We saw Riho versus Hater, but the week before was Riho versus, I think, one of the uh, NWO women or the Outcasts. A variation it's, of this, yes. It's, it's a variation on a theme. Well, I picked up 10 minutes on that. So then we come to the main event, Chris Jericho versus Keith Lee off a very odd-sounding confrontation last week. We get this match completely out of the blue. And, I, I, I mean, I got to be honest, in one year, Keith Lee has gone from limitless Keith Lee to if famous Amos joined Starfleet Academy. Oh, come on. <laughs> What <laughs> I've seen what the original famous Amos looked like, so I know who you're referring to. Yes, and and with Keith Lee's new wardrobe, he looks like he's he sees the fucking intergalactic ambassador from fucking the Romulans or something. Um, so the bell rang on this with 15 minutes on the air, and I was I was thinking they've got to be joking. But they they worked it if for one once the opponent of Jericho did not need to slow down so as to enable Mr. Jericho to keep up. It was the other way around. And they worked a big man, little man match, which they should, except if I guess it it if it's just another big man. Remember, we liked Keith Lee in NXT. And potential. In the past two years, I know he had health issues. If this is a health issue now, maybe he they shouldn't make him go 15 minutes. It, it, you can a big monster guy can do five and six minutes an out if you do it right. Why are they making him do this if, if it's a health issue? If it's not a health issue, and why the fuck do they want him to do this this long? And I mean, he would no shell, no shell. He would no-sell the chops and, like, level Jericho with a shoulder tackle or whatever, but then he went over and kissed him on the forehead. What, did you see that? What is that? Is I he Now, know. has he joined the mafia? How about Jericho's reaction to it? Well, I, I wasn't going to bring that up, but it was only about at half-mast. It wasn't really a full-on fucking boner. <laughs> But All anyway, right. that wasn't what I so, said, but okay. <laughs> so I right at this point when he kissed him on the forehead, I said, I'm about to give up. They were moving like they were in jello. And for the break spot, it, Keith Lee, he took a kick from Jericho and took a six stage rolling bump off the apron that Ox Baker would have been proud of. I mean, he could have had Fabergé eggs taped to various parts of his body and not broken any of them. But they went to the break and they come back and Jericho's getting heat on Keith Lee and it looked like the the bassist for an 80s hair metal band abusing a walrus. I don't know. <laughs> Keith made an alleged comeback. They kind of got lost. Lee hit a tackle. Took a while to get on the ropes. He did a moonsault off the second rope. He's amazingly agile in between moments of Severely compromised mobility. Um, when he does the moonsault, Keith Lee does. Jericho raises his knees and hurt his own legs, which that was a cute spot. And Lee got a choke slam and a two count. And then Jericho gets the walls, Jericho, and Keith gets the ropes. 
And then that's where this fucking finish. And again, Stace is brewing her custom-made imported tea in the kitchen, and I'm snort laughing, right? And she's, what's going on? I said, come here, watch this finish. Keith Lee, fireman's carry, lifts Jericho over his shoulders, and Jericho grabs referee Aubrey by the, like, collar of her shirt or whatever, and she immediately, obviously turns her back to where old Daniel Garcia is in Jericho's corner. And it's such an awkward thing. If you were being pulled this direction by this guy, you would not turn in this way. Meanwhile, Garcia jumps up on the apron and tries to hit Keith Lee in the back where he's got Jericho up on his shoulders, but Lee is so far out. The first time he swings and kind of pats him a little bit. <laughs> so that's, I guess Jericho said, back up. And and he backed up and he swung at him a little bit more. And that uh, was that supposed to cause Keith Lee to drop Jericho because that's what he did. But then Lee turns around and elbows Garcia and beals him over the top rope into the ring. And then he has to roll over next to Jericho so they can stand next to each other, stand up and line up for a double clothesline. And then Garcia goes ass over tea kettle and, Aubrey is busy with, you know, him while Keith Lee hits Jericho with a sit-out powerbomb. And this sounds like it's going quicker than it was. And the powerbomb looks great, but here comes Swerve. <laughs> and he hit Keith Lee with, was that a toolbox or was it a boombox? Some kind of big radio or big equipment case or whatever. <laughs> this and, is an HD, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And then Aubrey has shoved Garcia out of the way and turns around, and there's supposed to be nobody else there, and both the guys are laying there. <laughs> and Jericho puts his arm over Keith Lee, and Aubrey just staring, drops down and counts one, two, three, and then Stacy busts out, you lazy motherfuckers, and stood up and left the fucking room. She was offended by the fucking blaséness of this fucking rotten finish. And she hadn't done one in 20 years. And she could still have pulled it off better than that. And then, so Jericho is beating Keith Lee. And then here, apparently to make sure Keith is okay, comes Adam Cole down the, the ramp. And as Adam Cole is making his way to ringside, guess what? My DVR freezes because they're always within 30 seconds of going off the air every fucking week and somebody else comes out. Did he get super kicked or hurt or punished or talked down to in any way? What happened? I believe Adam Cole came out there and just talked to him, and that's kind of how things ended. So that's all we know. Adam Cole obviously referenced Keith Lee in a promo. It is interesting, and a lot of people have brought up the irony, that the story when Adam Cole <laughs> left WWE was that they wanted him to be a manager for Keith Lee, and he'd rather come here and wrestle to AEW, and here we are, full circle. Now maybe Keith Lee can manage Adam Cole. Here he is with his grandfather, <laughs> Adam Cole. Augustus Ulilies, Ulilies, Augustus Ulilies. U Ulysses, <laughs> or Ulilies, Augustus Ulysses Cole, his grandfather. All right, do we have ratings on this fiasco and we'll move on from AEW and cross the street? We do have ratings. The overall rating for AEW this week, April 12th, AEW Dynamite, 866,000 viewers. Wait, is that last week's? No, that's this week, April 12th. What for the last what two or three weeks has it been like eight thirty six eight sixty six back to eight sixty six? It's always in the same general range there now. Is it pretty? Have they bottomed out with these are the people who like the Buckaroo style of comedy wrestling and everybody else has given up? There's no fluctuation, and these people don't have lives, so they never leave their homes. They're not going to miss a week on TV. I don't know, but let's uh, look at where Let's examine all that. Let's examine it. 
The 8 o'clock hour, 8 to 8.15 p.m. This was compiled by WrestleNomics. Swerve Strickland versus Darby Allen with picture in picture. 919,000 viewers. Ouch. That is significantly lower than normal to start out with. But at least that means they ain't got Safer to fall. Segment 2, 8.15 to 8.30 p.m. The last three minutes of Strickland versus Allen as well as the MJF, Darby Allen, and Sting live in-ring promo, 901,000 viewers. See, uh, 18,000 down from a much lower than normal start, that's not as many as they usually lose. You can look at it that way. I think if they did lose any on something like that, it's probably just because it was getting a little long at the tooth before they knew that MJF was coming out or, you know, other things were going to go on, but uh, not bad. They're fairly flat. Segment three, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m. The final four minutes of the MJF Darby Allen and Sting in-ring promo. Powerhouse Hobbs versus Silas Young, as well as the post-match with Wardlow and the Jay White and Juice Robinson promo. <sighs> 902,000 viewers. <laughs> okay. So you can make the case that the people that were already into the whole MJF Darby Sting function at least stuck around to see the revol revolution, the resolution of that. So they were flat. This is a better pattern than they normally have on a television program, but it's starting to get to the point where we abandon hope. 8.45 to 9 p.m., segment four. Orange Cassidy versus Buddy Matthews with picture-in-picture. Picture, 854,000 viewers. And that's what I was kind of afraid of because uh, besides the fact that everybody knows and every, uh, what they're going to get with these people now, that's uh, it's not even possible that it's uh, going to be a title change or anything amongst a title that's not over. It's Buddy. Everybody knows what's going on here. So they're... Yeah, all right. See what happens at the top of the 9 o'clock hour. The 9 o'clock hour, segment 5, 9 to 9.15 p.m. The final three minutes of Orange Cassidy versus Buddy Matthews. The Christian Cage and Luchasaurus backstage promo, or video, whatever it was. Orange Cassidy and the Best Friends backstage promo. The Ethan Page in-ring promo, leading to a confrontation with Matt Hardy, Isaiah Cassidy, The Firm, Hook, and eventually the returning Jeff Hardy, as well as a Kenny Omega promo video. 896,000 viewers. Well... That's unexpected. At the top of the hour, they gain 42,000 people. They don't usually do that. At the, you can't mean to tell me that people flipped around and saw pockets and thought, well, I'll stay, I'll jump into this. So it had to be Julia Hart. Certainly. So no, I, th I, th I think we're without, they don't have serious sports competition right now, right? I mean, it's I baseball. So, I mean, Lots of games all throughout the well, country. But not, you know, playoffs and the getting down to the nut cut and meat of the matter. I think we've determined what range their audience is in now. Because if nobody was bailing out on this program, that's the AEW fan. They'll watch this shit no matter what. So they're 8 to 9.50 or whatever. Well, segment 6, 9.15 to 9.30 p.m., the Blackpool Combat Club's entrance. Brandon Cutler and Michael Nakazawa versus the Blackpool Combat Club, as well as the post-match angle with the Elite, and the Embassy's backstage promo, 886,000 viewers. Jesus Christ! I by George, I think we found them. They only lost, they've lost 100,000 fucking viewers in the past for goddamn main event guys. They lose 10,000 for Cutlet and Knock It Off. Oh my God. Well, you say we found them. We also have found the thing that drives them away. Uh oh. Segment 7 to 9.30 to 9.45. Time hour. I don't know what I was going to say there. 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. Segment 7. Reho and Sky Blue. 
versus the Outcasts with Picture in Picture, as well as the post match with Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker, and the entrances for Chris Jericho and Keith Lee, 789,000 viewers. Okay, well, there went the 100,000 people. Okay, and that's understandable. And finally, segment eight, 9.45 to 10 p.m., Chris Jericho versus Keith Lee with Picture in Picture and a post-match with Daniel Garcia and Adam Cole, 779,000 viewers. And that ain't bad it for it, over 15 minutes to only lose 10,000 people for that fucking quicksand love fest. Um, that's better than normal. They only, from start to finish, they lost 140,000 viewers and started lower but finished stronger and stayed more consistent than they usually do. So that has to be their audience. If their audience will watch that particular television program between 780,000 and, well, let's say 901,000, that's got to be their dedicated audience. Nobody that was just flipping by or wasn't really invested would have possibly stayed with almost any of this. Now, you still haven't watched All Access after AEW Dynamite, no, have you? No, no. I've, I've you need it. to see I've, it. I've been, I've been insulation, insulating things. I've insulated myself from that show. It will make you hate everyone far more than you do now, with the exception That's of Adam Cole, who you'll think is the nicest guy and should be involved <laughs> with anything other than wrestling. Uh, all righty then. That was AEW Dynamite for Wednesday, April 12th. And I guess before we go across the street and talk about what SmackDown did, we ought to go right down your street or up your alley and talk about what the Arcadian Vanguard Network is doing these days. That's right. Another action-packed and adventurous week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes. Of course, the wrestling news. Every morning, get your free daily wrestling newscast every single day. No opinion, no conjecture, no star ratings, just the actual wrestling news. No paywall. No paywall. It's for free. That's right. Because you know what happens when you have to pay for news. Money. Money changes everything. Check it out today at thewrestlingnews.com. You can download it directly or, of course... Wherever you find your favorite podcast, Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News, also on YouTube, on the official Arcadian Vanguard YouTube channel. Also want to make mention of Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon, available at suawpod.com, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. This week's guest, Mike Clark. Find out what it's like to go from being a WWF fan to working in Jack Tunney's Toronto office. Lots of cool stories here. Check it out today. SUAWPod.com or Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! See, I like that. It makes me feel like I'm kicking in the door when you play that sound effect as opposed to the boing and the usual doodle effects you have over there. Go through the archive today at 605pod.com, <laughs> available wherever you find. Your favorite podcast. Thank you so much to everyone who has been going through the archive. And of course, everyone who checked out Opening Day Star Wars. Available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The 605 Super Podcast. The Mothership. We gotta go. All right. We gotta, no, we, we, I wish we had to go. <laughs> that would mean we were done. You know, I watched SmackDown from... Friday evening, April 14th, a date that will live in infamy, just hours ago, and if I didn't have my notes in front of me, the thing that I remember that happened on the show was L.A. Knight got beat again. But of course, as Gary Hart used to say, repetition is the key when dealing with goofs. If they want to make sure that everybody knows that L.A. Knight couldn't whip cream with an outboard motor, then they got to do it every week, and that's what they're doing. Otherwise, I will refer to my notes, and Brian, if you could just, I don't know, do you have a, a loud, jarring sound effect if you hear me nodding off into 
slumberland, somnambulism even, uh, while I'm talking about this program. Let me see what I got here. Oh, doctor. It It hurts. It hurts. Don't go into the light. (laughs) All right, I guess I'm awake for a second now, maybe through the first hour of this thing. I'm available for soundtracks. I wish you were available for train tracks. <laughs> uh, anyway, we'll let we'll let Vince and, and Vince and a coil of rope will take care of you there, fucking Penelope. Uh, anyway, or Pauline is the case. But who was peril? Who was always in peril? Pauline, the perils of Pauline. That's who was always in peril. I had an I had a cousin named Peril one time. She was she was a homely girl. Nevertheless, I'm trying to do anything I can not to have to talk about SmackDown, but I guess we ought to just get right into it, shouldn't we? Um so again, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn are the in-ring promo for the first segment, the new tag team champions. It's been a mere two weekends now since WrestleMania. And you know they they actually came out basically and said something that I knew but had never just looked at it in this way before. That was the first time that the that the tag team championship was the main event at WrestleMania in 40 fucking years or whatever. Okay, boy, Vince, I wouldn't, did the Graham brothers scare him or, or fucking frighten him or insult him or Rocca and Perez? Well... To be fair, his dog one time. To be fair, it's not the first tag team match to main event at WrestleMania. Only the first tag team championship match. And many of the years that you're thinking of great tag teams, you had Hogan on top. You can have one of the tag teams main event over Hogan. Well, that's true. There hadn't been any good tag teams in 30 years. All right, I'll accept that. Thank you for reminding me of. That. I think the headbanger should have been in the main event, not Steve Austin. I'm not. I'm not saying that as much as I love Glenn and Ruth and Glenn and Glenn Kaz. and Ruth, Glenn and Ruth, <laughs> Glenn, and Glenn Ruth and Chaz Warrington as much as I love Glenn and Chaz. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake! And speaking of love, they love Sammy. They were chanting Sammy, Sammy. I wonder how Owens feels standing there like the fucking guy that holds James Brown's cape. You know, after all these years, they've been on somewhat of a par, and suddenly. Sammy took the rocket ship to Mongo and fucking Owen stayed on the ground. I guess he exceeded the weight limit that the pilot would allow on board. Mongo, Any- not, not Metaluna. Luna. Well, I met Luna. No, that was on that was on the movie was on last night. Oh. On Svanguli, which you didn't watch. Well, I was asleep. More more on that next week. Anyway, um, so regardless of anything. They say that they're going to be the the universal undisputed tag team champions in the WWE, regardless of what happens in the draft. But we know that sooner or later, the Usos are coming for a rematch. Apparently it's sooner because within three seconds after they uttered, or after uh, Owens, I believe, uttered those words, the Usos music hits. And I wrote, God, can they ever change anything? It's gotten to the point, this is a parody of the parody that they started doing of wrestling, and now they're parodying themselves. A guy or a team or some talent comes out and emotes on their own in the spotlight with their own microphones, like they're giving a dramatic reading, and then suddenly, as soon as they mention somebody's name, their music plays, and they're already standing by to immediately come out with their own microphones. And this went a long time and no new ground was covered when the Usos and Solo came out and they went back and forth. And finally they get in a fight. Except in this case, Riddle ran out and jumped Solo to start the big six way. And it was an exciting little scuffle for a second. And Riddle beat up Solo, who's supposed to be the fucking badass, tough guy. And they had to jerk Solo out by his feet to keep Riddle from pouncing upon him from the from the heavens. And now with Riddle in this, I'm really thinking that this whole thing is starting to wear out its welcome. What do you think? 
you know, maybe I'm alone on this, but throughout this show, here and then during the backstage stuff, I did have the thought that if they don't do something different with Sammy soon, I may get sick of Sammy. Because it's too much of the pacifist Sammy right now for me. And maybe I'm alone on that, and maybe this is just... Because again, the pace after WrestleMania for all of this stuff has been really, really weird. And I felt early in the show, I, I started thinking about it. You know, they, I still think they made the wrong decision at WrestleMania. Because if you think of all the possible outcomes and directions things could have gone for the bloodline, let alone Cody Rhodes, but just the bloodline, not really feeling all this right now. By the end, there was a little bit of intrigue, but I don't want to get there yet. But, you know, this was the first SmackDown in a while that after the opening promo, I turned it off and did other things. I didn't feel like I needed to stay around to see everything. And when I say see everything, sit through a ton of shit to get like two minutes of maybe good stuff at the end. Right. They got me to the point where I was doing that. This was the first week where I was a little tired of it. I had to go and after it, the fact and watch it. Well, I was about to say, and to, but to clarify, you went back and you just weren't interested enough to stick with it on your Friday night. You went back and caught up with it. I understand. There was um, nothing and, holding me to watching it live. There was nothing that felt like I had to see it tonight. Here's the thing. Maybe, maybe nobody's brought this up because maybe I haven't even said it in these words until right now. But maybe just because it's, it's right there in front of you. Even if the people, the fans, the people out there, if they like the program with Sammy and Kevin and the bloodline and or then the Usos and the whole bloodline thing, if, if they're like it, all this story, the problem is somebody needs to tell creative that if you don't have something fairly interesting for the personalities involved in the program to do on a particular program, they don't have to interact every fucking week with each other. You've still got the packages. You can still show what happened last week or what happened on Raw. You can have Kevin and Sammy beat another tag team to get a win and defend the title, or you could have the Usos do the same, try to climb back in contention, or you can have them talking about each other without fucking in-person 10 or 15 minute monologue with each other. They don't always have to interact live for the sake of your story. Maybe they think it means ratings. If that's the case, maybe have a few more interesting people around so you can mix things up a little bit. But when they have them interact and talk endlessly and or fight in singles matches, if it's a tag or a six man, if the two, captains are going to have a single or what just they're constantly interacting to the point where you're like the by the time they get to the big match it's not really that unique does that make any sense it does and again we're going to go through an interesting period of time where this is going to test all this out coming out of wrestlemania a lot of fans feel deflated a lot of other ones don't they want to see where things are going to go but between now and SummerSlam, there's a lot of time and a lot of a lot of weekly television shows, a lot of hours of TV, a lot of premium live events. So we'll see how they get there. And and also, as I mentioned with Riddle and more on that later, eh, eh. but the, the next match on the program was the battle of the broken video game. We obviously made mockery, and rightfully so, of All Friends Wrestling when they first went on the air and they had Miro and Pip Sabian and Whoever else they were involved with, I can't even remember. Maybe it was the Puddin' Gang, but they were all breaking each other's video games. And now here we are about three or four years later, and they're breaking video games on the WWE, and L.A. Knight broke Xavier Woods' video game. Oh, golly. I do love the fact that Miro came in wearing a Mickey Mouse shirt, and his gimmick was he was the best man for Kip's wedding. And then that just made him the best man. And then he was just a video game fiend. And then later on, he became a brute and beat people up. And then he's off TV. Whatever Tony has pitched since then has been the creative. He's like, no, that doesn't work for me. The video game shit worked fine for him. But whatever's been pitched since then, that's too far for him. Good guy. Yeah. Well, yeah. Now that you put it that way, how, <laughs> how 
But you Show know, up in your pajamas. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Put this guy over in a match. I cannot do that. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what? In all honest to God, <laughs> is, is every time I hear that, as the promoter in me wants to go, oh, it's working for you to cash this check, huh? Well, it ain't working for me to send you this fucking check anymore. You're going to come in and look at the fucking lights for everybody in the company, including the popcorn guy, or elsewise, we're done here. But I don't, anyway, back to this, back to this company of video game breakers. So it's Xavier Woods versus L.A. Knight. And I must admit that this is what really deflated me for the rest of the program because it was, well, it was 20 minutes into the show before the bell rang for the first match. And, and I wrote at the top, I said, oh, so they've buried L.A. Knight, but at least when he works, you can see somebody that looks and moves and is trying to work and act like a professional wrestler. And maybe this is the thing where he can beat a middle card baby face. <laughs> just to just to do it. Just to say, I'm, if LA Knight wins a match, are they going to have balloons and confetti drop from the ceiling? Because it's almost never happened before. Anyway, they, you know, they won a couple of minutes as usual. And it, everything was good. I'm not saying anything's wrong with Xavier Woods as a wrestler. He's he's athletic, he can work, he can do good stuff, he's got oomph, it's the problem, the gimmick. The trombones and unicorns and rainbows and lollipops and cereal. And uh, we've mentioned numerous times the singing, promos, and the whole, all the weirdness. We don't want to see anybody involved in the new day because of that. But he's having a good match here with L.A. Knight. And they, as I said, they want a couple minutes to break. They come back. L.A. gets some heat. Xavier makes a comeback. Gets a false finish. Two count. L.A. gets a rope. L.A. Knight hits a power slam and a big leap at elbow drop. And they do some back and forth. And L.A. O'Connor roll up and holds the tights, but the referee sees it. <laughs> he gets off the roll up and goes and argues with the referee. And Xavier Woods, O'Connor roll-ups him, if that is the proper phraseology or whatever, and pulls his tights one, two, three. And I just, I threw my hands up near. I, I give up. That's a great finish if your heel is over. But since he is portrayed as a complete and total loser who, when you do see him, gets his ass kicked, and he, and you don't see him more often than you do see him, a la WrestleMania, then what the fuck is this? Just everybody in the company. It, it just slap him, piss on him, pin him, beat him, make a flunky out of him. What in the... <laughs> now, does, did, it, does this work better to get him over, or would just having him come out there, win a match three out of four weeks, and do a promo all four weeks have done a better job? Well, yeah. <laughs> that's the point it's like it's like this guy got himself over and they're like okay now let's just keep beating him it's like this weird wwe like i don't know who they're testing the wrestler or the fans but someone's gonna give up soon enough well i was about ready to but i thought well we're not really even halfway through this journey into hysteria so i'll give it a little bit more time and we came back from the break and there's gunther in the back with his his boys, the Imperium, and I start listening to this for a second, and guess who walks in blowing a trombone? Xavier Woods. Xavier Woods. And every time Gunther tries to speak, he goes, Mwah, with the trombone. From right next to him. Yes. Yes. And so then they get, they have words, and they are uh, setting up Gunther versus Woods and his boner. And I don't want to see that either. We have spent a lot of time talking about locker room etiquette and locker room fights. If someone blows a trombone right next to you every time you try to speak, are those grounds that kick their ass immediately? I have never seen it come up. <laughs> in my experience in, in wrestling, there were no trombones involved in any locker room dissension, discussion, 
dissertation or aggravation. It's a brand new one on me. Giant empty hallway. This guy and his two friends are standing there talking. They're putting up with this cameraman filming them. And all of a sudden, this guy's like, I'm going to go over there and fuck with them with my red trombone. With my trombone. Up, up, and away with my beautiful, my beautiful trombone. Do -do 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 -do. Not to excuse the booking of L.A. Night, which has been atrocious. And I'm sure in their eyes, they're either going to repair it or this is just what it is. But does Xavier Woods beating him make a little more sense? Does Xavier Woods, I guess, winning a match make more sense because it's setting up Gunther beating him on TV? Well, yes, that. Although it shouldn't it, have been L.A. Knight. It just shouldn't have been L.A. Knight. He could, he could win over anyone to go get beat by Gunther, but it happened to be L.A. So now L.A. Knight has been beaten by the fucking trombone player that's about to get slapped around by Gunther. So he's way down on the food chain. And that's the problem. It's like uh, they didn't want to do uh, Xavier Woods versus Marcel because no one would want to see that at all. But at least LA Knight's in there, so people are intrigued by the match. He's too good. <laughs> How do I phrase it? He's he's, like, he, no, that, that's actually, that is an old locker room common expression. He's being penalized for being too good of a worker. Yeah. And, and and a lot of Arn Anderson went through some of that in the '80s in Crockett. Although penalized was a whole different thing back then. He was never treated like this or just beaten like a drum on television. But you were penalized when the 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 worker of the group would always be the one to do the job. So Arn had a bit of that. But now it's it's a whole new level here when. You don't ever actually get to even beat job guys first before you just you just get on TV and start losing. That never that would I can't think of any time in any territory in any period of wrestling where you brought a guy that you had any plans for whatsoever. I'm not talking about, oh, they're poor old. Cooter McGee will give him a job, you know, in first match, you know, cards somewhere, whatever the fuck. I'm talking about anybody you brought in as a talent and intended to utilize in any fashion. They never fucking got beat once or even twice, much less weekly on television until they had had a number of wins. So you knew to take them halfway seriously. Based on who you see they're using on the roster there, who would you set up for Gunther right now? Oh, gee, I can't even... The only people I can remember on the fucking <laughs> roster is the Bloodline and Sammy and Kevin and Maddie Riddle, Bro Bro, whatever his fucking name is, and... Gunther will go to Raw. That'll probably be what they do. And the New Day and the Vikings and fucking... We, now we'll find out Shaky Nakamura's back here in a minute. More on that later. But there's it's the same 14 fucking guys on these two- and three-hour shows every week anyway. They've, they've only got 150 people in developmental, and this is the... That's the big difference between Dynamite and SmackDown. Dynamite has like 150 people on every episode. SmackDown has eight. Yeah. All right, anyway, moving along. Um... Sammy, the pacifist, as you uh, referred to him earlier, is in the back, and he doesn't want Riddle to get hurt in this. Thing. Would he, he's a goddamn ex-fucking MMA shoot fighter. And look at the state of Sammy. I mean, we love him. He's he's that lovable fucking goofball Sammy Zane. but if he ain't going to get badly hurt, I don't think Riddle is. Fucking ginger Muslim French Canadian. But, uh, but like you said, it's just... Uh, and Owens has that method of delivery when, especially I've noticed from where, when he's not particularly a hundred percent on board with the creative, he has that way of winking at you with his tonal quality. When he's saying something like he's almost sending out by mental telepathy to the fans. This is what I'm supposed to be saying, but we all know it's hokey and I'm just, you know, doing it kind of thing. He's not really into it. Sammy's trying to talk Riddle out of getting involved so he doesn't get hurt. And Matt Riddle may be a shoot fighting athlete. And that's the problem. They used to salivate over legitimate athletes, legitimate fighters, legitimate shooters in 
the wrestling business, and now they've got one up there, and they have done everything possible to dress him and present him and make him look and act and speak like a complete mushed mouth moron. What are your thoughts on that little backstage promo? I really can't add too much to it. Again, I'm not really digging Sammy uh, the last couple of weeks. They got to do something else with him, I think. And I'm not a big fan of Riddle. For what it was, it was okay. I mean, them kind mm-hmm. of explaining. Actually, that was more after this when they explained why Riddle and Solo have an issue. But, nah, I mean, you explained uh, everything with this. Well, then we go to the Judgment Day. And, of course... If we see the Judgment Day, they're going to have to fight uh, the other side of this equation, Domin- or not Dot, but Rey Mysterio and his newfound friends, Pablo Escobar and the Lucha Suits. We, it just remains to be seen how this is going to happen, because we know what's going to happen, because they do the same thing. The same people interact every fucking week. So, but in this case, they added a new wrinkle. Did you see they went to the back where there's Damian Priest, Rhea Ripley, and Dominic, and they do a backstage interview where they basically don't really say much of anything, and then they enter into the arena for an in-ring promo. They did a fucking backstage promo before their in-ring promo. Have you, what the fuck? Yeah, I can't really explain that. I will say, though, seeing the three of them in the back without Finn Bauer, it looked right. Oh, yeah. It looked exactly right. The three of them together, no Finn Bauer, that's what it should be. Well, they, they're they in the ring now on their second promo in a row. So Damian Priest was in the ring, and he cut the promo on his friend Bugs Bunny that he choke slammed through the announced desk and he's going to be bugs is going to be the host of the pay-per-view in puerto rico damien's going to be there's going to be trouble we can tell there's going to be trouble right there in river city between the bunny man it could that be it could that be an album like the bunny man or maybe that's his backup band bugs bunny and the bunny men shouldn't it be the bunny band well it could be the bunny band i think that sounds good the bunny band That's what I said, bunny bread. Anyway, so, you know I hate people that sing old commercial lines and people don't know what the fuck they are. So anyway, they've showed the VTR twice, uh, at least, of Damien slamming him through the table, and then suddenly, music plays, and here comes, you'll never guess who, ladies and gentlemen, Pablo Escobar and the Lucha Suits, who attack from behind. And boom, boom, boom. They And then we go into, after a break, we come back and it's Priest and Escobar. And they're already in it. So now we've got a single match amongst the factions that are involved again. And they go a couple minutes. They go to the break and they come back and they only go another couple minutes. And it, again, there's nothing wrong with this, but it's the same thing every week. And then the the baby faces on the floor jumped on Dominic when he interfered, and Priest came, and it was a cool spot, but he just dumped the two lucha suit guys, uh, double clothesline them both over the rail into the front row. But again, in every one of these three-man teams, the whether it's Roman Reigns and the Usos, whether it's Escobar and the lucha suits, whether it's Help me. Who else? There's always, oh, Imperium, Gunther, and Zabadon, and Furnum's Navitz. There's always two flunkies and the guy, and the big guy in the other faction can just manhandle the two other guys. You see what I'm saying here? Anyway, so Damien dumps him over the rail. Escobar hits a dive. Zelina and Rhea get in a fight, and Priest choke slams Escobar one, two, three. The last 90 seconds were very entertaining and chaotic, I thought. The previous 10 minutes hadn't set the world on fire. And then Priest clears off the announce desk and goes to put Escobar through it, but music plays, because who are we missing? Here comes Rey Mysterio. And he gets in a fight with Dominic and Judgment Day pulls Dominic out and a nice little afterbirth there. It was exciting for the last few minutes, but 
it's the same people that are going to do if the baby faces are in the ring, the heels are attack them. If the heels are in the ring, then the baby faces will attack them. Am I just, am I making too much of this or am I really seeing the same shit happen every week in the same format? And it's not just the judgment day and what is now the LWO, but this is across the board on these shows. But specifically here, if the promo had gone somewhere, they kind of had me for a moment because they're cool visual. I wanted to hear it. And I know they're trying to do something new with Escobar and his guys. And I mean, reviving the LWO from 20 something years ago, 25 years ago, I guess, is an interesting decision to make to try to make people care about them. Imagine if in 1998, when the LWO originally happened. Or maybe 99, I forget what year it started. Okay, well, let's say 99 then, 24 years ago. Let's say, what if in, in the Attitude Era on WCW Monday Nitro, if they had tried to bring back a gimmick that they had done in 1975? What would people have said? Well, no, that's, I mean, it's a few years earlier, but that's why no one cared about the new Blackjacks. It's just, it was something from a long time ago. What would have been an example they could have done in the WCW era that they could have brought back from years earlier? I mean, it's hard to even think of examples of factions that really weren't factions. I mean, a new Freebirds would have bombed. I mean, a new Midnight Express, we saw well, it did. Yeah. It did, remember? We had to work with them in 1989. Oh, that's right. I wasn't even thinking about Fucking Jimmy Garvin. <laughs> yes. That was only 10 years after they started. And uh, yeah, and that was 10 years after that. See what I'm saying? It's it's like people now, the fans that are left are holding on to the memories that they have of the last time this shit was good and it gets longer and longer. You know, honestly, people like me did. We looked back and you, you always would have, but the average fan was not nostalgic for the 60s in the 80s because the 80s was so fucking good. But now the average fan is nostalgic for the 90s and we're in the 20s. Anyway. Paul Heyman was in the back giving the pep talk to Solo and he mentioned every single one of the Samoans <laughs> and said, don't humiliate so-and-so and don't let so-and-so down and Rikishi and Yokozuna and Afa and Sika and blah, blah, blah. And finally he worked himself up to where he got scared that he'd piss Solo off. But Solo said, yeah, tell, tell the tribal chief I got this. This was great. Uh, Heyman has a red phone case, which I thought was funny for whatever reason. I can't even explain why <laughs> I thought that was funny. But Heyman was great here. Solo was, you know, Solo really, if you think about it, this is a guy that really didn't impress us too much in NXT that, of course, he has the natural connection because of his family, but they put into a main event program. They put into either upper mid card or directly into the main event picture. And he's done really well in this role. He's done he, really, really yeah. well. He's believable. And no one complains about the fact they took a relative rookie and put him into this role. So I think that is something that should be said. Yeah, he has done well. And I've, I've compared him in, in the past. Uh, boy, if Jacob Fatu was in that spot, just because the difference in the look and probably the experience level. But Solo has done a very good job with what they've asked him to do. And he's, he's been thrown out there in kind of sink or swim situations sometimes. So, but, but again, it's, it's genealogy. The Samoans, for whatever reason, they can do this shit. I was waiting for Heyman to mention Manu. Oh. Or the Tonga Kid. I mean, there was, I was like, who else is he going to name here? But good promo. But he should have he should have mentioned Chief Peter Maivia, just for the sake of it. Well, he actually went directly with people who were blood relatives as opposed know, to just a I, general. I know. But I'm thinking that Young Rock would have been pissed he didn't mention Chief Peter. Aloha. Hi, Chief. I, I think the, the woman that, that uh, played Leah Maivia, I think she should have some kind of acting award or whatever. Anyway, moving on. So the next thing on this program was the Liv and Raquel 
live in-ring promo. They're the happiest girls in the whole USA. Do you remember when Raquel Rod? Now, what was her name in NXT? Was it Raquel Gonzalez? Raquel Gonzalez. Ra Raquel Rodriguez. We That's made right. fun of that. But when Raquel Gonzalez was in NXT, she was dressed in leather and she had a severe, you know, striking look and she didn't smile and she was presented as a badass and, and bigger than all the girls that you could buy her as like a, a female Kevin Nash, a female diesel type of bodyguard, maybe with some annoying, whiny, bitchy, smaller girl or whatever. She was impressive. And then they put her on the main roster. And within three weeks, you could tell they started having her put on a bunch of smile, makeup smile. and smile. And we still get the big shoulder spread, but now she looks over her shoulder and smiles about it instead of being like, look at me, bitches. I can break all of you in half. And it's, it's, and the ha fluffy hair and just smiling and makeup and happy and rosy cheeks. And what they had something there. Can you, that could have been, I mean, it's almost like with the tur the second Terminator comes back after the first Terminator. They got Ripley established. They could have had fucking Raquel the Terminator come in. There you got money. See if she can knock off Rhea Ripley, who would suddenly become a baby face if this was a year down the road. Whatever the fuck. But instead, they've got this smiley girl with this smiley little girl partner and smiley little girl shit that don't make me smile. And Cruella and Chelsea interrupted, and they did a lot of WWE-style dramatic discourse, and then they got in a little cat fight, and the heels powdered out. That's what happened there. <sighs> I don't mean to just steamroller you. Did you have any comments to add on that? No, when that was on, I had something else to do. Well, there you go. There's always that pesky thing that you got to do right when stuff like that comes on so shaky nakamura is back again he looks like the heel gang leader in every golden harvest kung fu movie ever um i don't know everybody loved him for a while right and then something happened by the time we started watching to where we're going, what, this was the guy that everybody said was so great? Yeah, they called him up to the main roster. That's what happened. He was tremendous in New Japan. He was great in NXT. And then Vince got a hold of him. And, you know, they brought him back here. He came out in a different uh, robe, I guess I would say, than we usually see him come out in. So I was like, okay, they're bringing him back. They can do something a little different. You know, way back, he was a little more serious, but you can't just go completely that way because he's established that he's a artiste as they put it and then he took it off and he's wearing a bodysuit like the lead singer of the darkness so i didn't know what to think of this i want to give him a chance because i was a big fan of him in new japan him and ishii in 2015 was the match ishii. Of the year. that was the match of the year that was such an incredible match i mean it was a long time ago now though i gotta remember that but yeah i want to dig his wwe stuff but i have not been a main roster fan of his well, he is uh, matched up here against the former Mosh Pit Jones. What's his name? Um, Madcap. Madcap. Madcap Moss. And Madcap now has a, some miscellaneous girl giving him... It's basically Emma. An, uh, Emma. Okay, Emma. I don't think they said her name, or if they did, I don't hear it, but I know who she is. Unless it's Emma Peel, I don't give a shit. She's dead. Well, that's, and I don't give a shit. Um, but she's not just giving him a pep talk. She's basically giving him instructions. So it, I remember when I saw this guy, I said, this guy's a great fucking athlete. When the, he had a match once with somebody where he kind of sort of just wrestled. And I said, holy shit, he's a great athlete. His shit looks good with direction and a real name and a gimmick. You could do something with it, but... That has continued to not happen. He had a horrible gimmick with Corbin. He's had a rotten name. Now he's being told what to do by some random girl wrestler. And the bell rang for the match. We were an hour and a half into the show for the second match. And basically, 
I said, I'm going to watch this to see Moss and uh, because I've liked him in the in the past athletically and see what Shakey has to offer these days. And the very first thing that happened was Moss hits a shoulder into the turnbuckle and then picks Nakamura up like a scoop slam, apparently trying to boost him for a drop behind. And both of them just fell in a heap on the mat. And I said, well, fuck the, and I hit fast forward, but it didn't really matter because within one minute later, Nakamura had already beat him. One, two, three. So thanks for coming mosh pit. And here's another thing that I would like possibly a moratorium declared on. I've mentioned many times that wrestlers are the worst criminals in the world, right? They, every time they commit a crime or break the law in any way, they actually do it on video with a camera, right? Five or 10 feet from them. So in this case, the camera is in the back following Brown Strongman and Ricochet just walking and chatting with each other. It's not even a, an interview that's been set up. There's no reason for the camera to be on them. They're just walking down the hallway. And suddenly, five seconds later, the Vikings come in and beat the teetotal shit out of them. Never noticing the television camera five feet away from them. What? And that was it. They just beat them up and that was it. 30 seconds. What? Why? It's boring at this point. It happens weekly, multiple times a week. And it's so fucking fake. I'm not a Braun Strowman fan, but considering the way they're using him, they must have got a sweetheart deal when they brought him back. Right? Because they're not using him like someone they're paying a considerable amount of money to. No. Well, I mean, you know, what were his options? Turn over fucking buses or goddamn come back with hat in hand, I guess. Or he could control his narrative. And, well, apparently he was, the narrator said, and Brown was losing money, like leaking like a sieve. and. Decided to go back to the only job he's ever had that paid him any money. And then finally we came to the main event, which was Riddle versus Solo. And I know, I know I have a journalistic duty, but after this show, and it's Riddle, and I try to, I just, I zoned out. They didn't go that long to begin with. Um... Well, basically... What about Heyman's promo at the beginning? Well, hold on. That's what I was going to say. Because basically, I was starting to skip ahead a bit, and then I saw Heyman speaking. So I was like, okay. And Paul makes a big announcement that two weeks from tonight on SmackDown, it's going to be the rematch, the Usos and Zayn and Owens for the tag team title and Paul's last line is, and the Usos are looking at Zane and Owens, and they're breathing fire and huffing and puffing. And Paulie's looking at Sammy and Kevin, but then he says, because that will settle it, because Roman Reigns is losing patience with the two of you. But he turned to look at the Usos, and the Usos didn't notice that he had turned to look at them. Assuming that he was talking to Sammy and fucking Kevin. And that moment was the payoff for watching this whole episode. And then, instead of going into the match, they went to another break. So they actually had entrances and, and another promo. And then, they go to the break again. So they came back, they had four minutes of match. They came back, they had three minutes of match. And it's Riddle, so who gives a shit? And then, I know you'll never believe this, ladies and gentlemen. But Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn and the Usos got in a fight on the floor. <laughs> and Riddle flipped and dove on the Usos. And then Solo just hit him with the fucking spike. One, two, three. And then Solo threw Riddle over the announcer's desk and turned the desk over on top of him. And that was, and then Sammy and Kevin went to dig him out and all the heels made faces. So that was basically the the announcement is in two weeks from tonight, you know, and and again, when are the Usos going to watch this show and find out Heyman was talking to them? But otherwise, 
it was two hours. There was four matches, and none of them were particularly scintillating. Or even at, at least it's not like AEW. You get a bad match in AEW, it goes on forever. You get a bad match in the WWE, just like any good match. It doesn't last very long at all. And that was SmackDown. And the problem is those segments with Heyman and everything he does, and when Roman Reigns is actually there, and a lot of the intrigue around the Usos and everything else, it's great stuff, but you sit through this whole show, and if you really think about it, if you said, make me a compilation tape of all the good stuff with the bloodline the last... You know, since 2023 began, it would be a two-hour tape or less. Yeah. There's so little of the actual good stuff we get on these shows, and so many commercials at weird times. Maybe the guy who formats the show is the guy who has to run around and get everyone as soon as their name is mentioned. <laughs> to run out there and have the music played. But you sit through a lot of crap for, like I said, the payoff for this whole episode was Heyman. The Heyman promo in the back, but Heyman looking at the Usos... And then they just cut the break. That was the highlight of the whole show. Well, there you have it. Speaking of shows, whose is this? If you're saying this is the end, this is the highlight of this show. I can't remember whose show this is, is what I'm saying. This to is you. your is it show. Yours or is it mine? This is your show. Of course it's this mine? is your show. Yes. Then are we done here? Well, it's your show. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for... Sitting through what we hope was a more entertaining recap of this week in wrestling than this week in wrestling was. And Brian's show is coming up on Tuesday or Wednesday. Or what day does that thing come out? How much? What day is it now? It's, I don't know. It's coming, ladies and gentlemen. Well, and I'll leave that there. Until then, for Brian, I'm Jim. Thank you. Fuck you. And bye-bye, everybody.